Okay, start again. <laughs> start again. Apologies for people having to hear my introduction twice. <laughs> um, good morning and welcome. I'm Kerry Brooks from the Asia Pacific Institute for Learning and Performance. So we're a leading industry body for L&D professionals and we pride ourselves for offering great value uh, um, through our resources and our benefits. So, and also we focus on creating opportunities um, to support um, the L&D community, not just our members, but the wider community as well. So. Um, just we've had a request from somebody that came on early um, that we share who we are and where we're from. So if you'd like to, as we go through the session in the chat box, please do that. And I've just got one other um, housekeeping request is that if you could please mute yourself um, when not talking. So I'm sure there'll be some time to interact and Julie can indicate when that's happening. But for now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our facilitator for this morning. Um, Julie Mason, who's really well known, but is regarded as one of the top 25 LinkedIn experts worldwide by her peers and has been featured on the cover of Social Media Success Magazine Australia and is the link and also is the LinkedIn tutor at the University of Sydney and Recruiter.com, which apparently is one of the largest job websites in the world. So Julie is an in-demand speaker, so we're very lucky to have her today, and founder of, and creator of LinkedIn Sales Formula, one of the most comprehensive and supported or supported LinkedIn training programs for business in the world today. So I'm sure Julie's going to provide lots of takeaways and valuable tips today. So Julie, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Kerry. I'm delighted to be here today. And yes, today is going to be a fast and furious, deep dish content <laughs> serve of LinkedIn for everybody. And I'm going to encourage you all to have a notepad and pen ready. I, I literally, um, 15 minutes ago, just finished up a call with a US and Australia mastermind and um, a 90 minute call with them teaching them LinkedIn. And they have held up their notepads and said, we have never taken so many notes as we have since high school or college as we have today. And I'm gonna encourage you guys to do the same because I'm going to give you some amazing tips on how to use LinkedIn, how to position yourself for success on LinkedIn, how to, how to use this valuable platform to grow your business, to generate leads and sales, and how to do it easily and elegantly and so that you build trust all the way along. So we're gonna have a beautiful time together. It's gonna to be interactive. We are on this call together for three hours. We will be stopping for a much needed uh, deep breath and a toilet rest <laughs> at some point. Kerry, I'm gonna need you to keep me on top of that. So we're gonna stop at 11.30 for a good 15 to 20 minutes to give everybody a chance to stretch your legs, get the oxygen flowing again, get the brain going, rush off and get another cup of coffee because you will need to be caffeinated for this one, I'm sure. <laughs> but we're gonna have a lot of fun, okay? so. I can't see all of you. I'm gonna rely on our chat box a lot. If you could, if whenever I ask for you to engage, I'm gonna ask you to- I'm okay, you ready. The chat box, please mute yourself as we, we've done that already. And um, don't use the Q&A box because I won't be able to see that and the chat box at the same time. So I'm gonna get you to jump into the chat box. And many of you are already doing that. I can't wait to read all of those later, but. But right now, we have a, a, a ton of stuff to go through, and I'm super excited for you guys to be on the call. So let's dive in. All right. So our agenda today that I'm going to be covering in this three hours together, and thank you, Kerry, again for inviting me. I'm super delighted to be sharing this with your members and guests today. We're going to be covering the power of LinkedIn profiles. We're going to be covering the power of LinkedIn search and a lot of people don't know how to use that really well. So we're going to take it as if nobody knows anything and we're going to start from scratch and I'm going to show you from newbie to advanced how to use all of these amazing tools. We're going to talk about the power of connection and the power of content. So we have a lot to cover today. And without further ado, I'm going to dive right on in. First of all, Kerry, thank you for introducing me. For those of you who don't know me very well, and many of you may not, um, I have been in sales for over 20 years and I've run an online business teaching social media and mostly LinkedIn for the last six years specifically. Um, but I've been teaching LinkedIn uh, for the last 10, but I, I taught Facebook and Pinterest and YouTube and everything as well. And then I, I specifically moved to LinkedIn only about six years ago. 
And so my background is traditional sales. I've done 15 years in door-to-door -door cold calling. So when I come and teach LinkedIn, I'm really looking at this from a sales strategy. I'm looking to at all the elements of how to connect with people, how to build rapport and trust in those relationships, and how to take that relationship, nurture it, and convert that into being a client elegantly through that whole process. And so we're going to touch on a lot of that today. So that's my background. I'm not going to go into it much further than that, aside from, yes, I lecture at the University of Sydney um, as their LinkedIn tutor. I also lecture at the University of Queensland and Griffith University. And I also am a faculty member for recruiter.com for their certification program, uh, teaching uh, people how to set up their new recruiting business worldwide. So recruiter.com is the third largest recruitment website in the world. Kind of like Seek here in Australia, for those of you who are familiar with that, but it's the third biggest one in the world. And so I work with them on a consistent basis. So that's a bit of background with me. I'm bored with me now. I hope you are too. Let's move on to you and how we can help you get great results today. All right. So in the 10 years that I've been teaching LinkedIn, I've seen very common mistakes being made on this platform. And I want to start off with a prelim on this around what those common mistakes are and what I know to be the five critical shifts you need to make to be successful on LinkedIn. And then we're going to go into the profile. We're going to go into search. We're going to go into content and connection, okay? But I want to rip through this fairly quickly because I've got some gifts to give you as well. There's going to, I, I love giving great value. So you're going to get a ton of it today. And, um, and we're going to start off with this because when we get this stuff sorted, and I think this is really fundamental for us to really start with a clean slate, whether you've been on LinkedIn for a while or you're relatively new to it, let's start with a clean slate and get cracking. Okay, so common mistakes that I see on LinkedIn is the first one is this spray and pray approach. I'm just going to move the video off to the side there so I can see. This is spray and pray approach to LinkedIn. And this often happens when people hear about LinkedIn as this great platform, which it is, and they get very excited about using it and they've got real, no, no real strategy whatsoever. And they kind of, they're massively reaching out to connect with people and they're posting content and they're endorsing people and they're joining groups and they're doing all of the setting up company pages and showcase pages and everything's happening and it's a frenetic energy and but there's no real strategy no real direction to it they're just having a stab at everything and and when that happens what will what will occur inevitably that i see is people get really frustrated because they don't get the desired results that they're looking for or they're hoping for for their business and they end up just going throwing their hands in the air and going oh my god linkedin's a waste of time i don't want to have anything to do with it so the spray and pray approach is one of the common mistakes that I see happening on LinkedIn and, and a lot of people fall into that. The second, uh, or, and by the way, these are in no particular order and I put it number one and number two and number three, et cetera, but they're in no particular order. So if I say the second commonest, commonest mistake on LinkedIn, it's just that it's got number two there and that's how my brain is operating. But one of the biggest mistakes, and this is not just on LinkedIn, but when I mentor people with their sales strategy and their marketing strategy, I see this all the time. It's people not being clear about their ideal target audience. And it's a big issue because when you are unclear, then it's really hard for you to find who it is that you want to, uh, to really approach and see those opportunities popping up. And I'll give you a really good example of what happens when you get super clear on your ideal uh, target audience? What happens, think of it like buying a car. Probably everybody here on this call has bought a car at some point in time. And when we first start the car hunting journey, and I recently did this with my mum, she bought a new car. And so we literally went through this. It was quite interesting to realise that, yep, that was the process. Um, is that when you start buying a car, you start looking at, okay, do I want a sporty little number? Do I want a four-wheel drive so I can go off-roading? Do I want a family sedan? Do I want a, a city car where I can park in small spaces? You kind of look at 
you know, 88,000 models and then kind of break it into kind of categories. We start off with the big categories. And once we work out what category we want in a car, we then start looking at the specifications of that. You know, the fuel economy, what space it is, you know, uh, what's the Bluetooth array and the connectivity, what's the interior like, da 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 da, right? And when we work out what those specifications are, now we can sort of look at apples versus apples. We can look at what make a model of has those best specifications. And then when we've worked out that, we start price hunting. And once we've got the make, the model, the specifications that we're looking for and the price that we want, here's what happens. We've made the decision that we're going to buy that car for that price from that particular person, whether it's a dealer or not. And as we leave our house to drive to that person to buy the car off them, here's what's really interesting. Because we've told our subconscious mind, this is the car, this is the specifications, this is the make and model, this is what I'm going to pay for it. And we've made that decision to buy that car. We drive out our driveway. We start to see that car everywhere. We never knew it existed before, or if we did, it was on the very peripherals of our attention span. But once we'd made a decision that that's what we wanted and how we told our, our subconscious mind that we wanted that, we saw it everywhere. Our subconscious mind will actively look for that. And so this is why it's really important that you get super clear on who your ideal client avatar is. And I'm going to give you your first gift today. I want you to jump onto, at some point, my website, juliemason.com.au. And on the home page there, I've got a worksheet on how to create your ideal B4B client avatar. And it's very detailed. Now, the reason I created this is, A, I saw so many people just have no idea. And, and if they did, it was so vague that you wouldn't be able to hit it, you know, with a 10-foot barge pole. So it was, it was really important that I got this out. And it's interesting that I was asked by my marketing mentor a few years back to do this process for him. And he's had thousands of client avatars sent to him. And the feedback that he gave me was, Julie, I, I've literally seen more of these than you can count. And he said, this has been the most detailed one I've ever seen. And it really dives into all the criteria that you need to do your marketing correctly, to, to really resonate with your ideal audience correctly and to attract them to you. So I went, wow, that's really interesting because I just took it for granted that's what everybody did. So I created a process for this and I'm giving it to you guys for free. I encourage you to do this homework. It's invaluable. It will take you some time without doubt, but doing that, investing into doing that will pay you massive dividends, I promise you. So this is my first gift to you today. Download that free worksheet. It's going to be an enormous value for you. All right. Another common mistake that we see on LinkedIn is not articulating your message clearly. And I'll give you a really good example of this, is that uh, at the beginning of this year, I had a a message uh, conversation on LinkedIn with one of my connections. They had reached out to congratulate me on a work anniversary and I, I messaged them back and said, thank you very much. By the way, um, message, message people when they've got a work anniversary or a happy birthday. It's a beautiful soft touch point where uh, there's no agenda to it other than just a nice way to show that you care and, and don't do the standard template message that LinkedIn suggests. Put some thought into it. And it actually helps to really nurture those relationships without any agenda behind it at all. It's a great touch point. So it also opens up conversation when people um, congratulate you on your birthday or your work anniversary or whatever. And so I responded to him and I said, thank you so much. How's the new year going for you? And he said, oh, not really well. And I went, oh, that's no good. And throughout the conversation, I found out that he was applying for a number of CFO positions, chief financial officer positions. In fact, he had applied for 200 between December and January and he had not received a single callback. That's devastating, right? Absolutely devastating. I, my heart fell when I heard that. And I said, look, let's jump on the phone. I had a quick look at his profile and I could see exactly what the problem was. 
his profile did not articulate his value to the companies that he was trying to be employed by. And so they, anybody, by the way, any recruiter, if you're looking for any position as a, even if it's a contract, for example, they will look at your LinkedIn profile if it's around that $90,000 or above. They're going to check you out. And if your profile isn't smick and smart and really showing your value, you may miss opportunities. And that's what was happening to Peter, my client. And so we straightened up his profile. We got his value you really showcased the value that he brought and literally within a couple of days he was getting callbacks for those interviews and I'm pleased to say I was so thrilled in fact I did the happy dance video for him I was so thrilled that he got a job within two weeks from us updating his profile and really resetting that value property and that's the power of articulating your message and it's not only for job hunting but it's for seeking out new prospects and and contract work as well. So it's really important that you get that messaging working well. The other common mistake, number four, is our poor call to action. You've got the opportunity on LinkedIn and, and a lot of people are quite nervous about doing a call to action. They feel that it might be a bit spammy, right? And so for those of you who are thinking it's a bit spammy, I want you to reset your mindset on this and realize that if you have showcased the value that you can bring to somebody, they're going to want to know what the next step is to take um, that process further with you. And if you don't tell them that, you are literally cheating them out of the opportunity of working with you. You are not serving them well. So be clear on your calls to action. Now, a call to action could mean, you know, phone us. It could mean download our worksheet, which is what I've already done, right? It could, be, um, it could be watch our video. Uh, all of these are where you're asking them to take some action with you. And here's a really interesting tip. I want you to write this down. This is really important. And this not only works, this is, this is not just important for LinkedIn, but this is important for your website as well. So for those of you who have your own website, really pay attention to this. The lowest converting call to action that you can do is asking people to email you. So if you have on your on your LinkedIn profile, for example, and we will go live onto LinkedIn for a lot of today, but if you have on the bottom of your about section, which by the way, used to be called your summary section, it's now about, if you have on the bottom of your about section, email me for if you'd like to work together or something like that at, you know, joeblogs at gmail.com.au or whatever it might be that will get very, very little traction. And here's why. As human beings, we don't want to stuff up. We don't want to look like a fool. So if we don't know what to write to approach you correctly, we, in, when in doubt, we won't take any action at all. Isn't that interesting? So if your website, for example, the only call to action you have on your website is to drive them to your contact page where you've got fill in your name, your email and, and a blank paragraph or a blank box for them to message you, I will lay odds on it that you get very few people filling that in. And the reason for that is they don't know what to write. So if you're asking people to email you or message you on LinkedIn, you probably won't get a great deal of conversion happening from that. I would much rather that you ask people to phone you or to fill in a form, a questionnaire to apply for a 30 minute conversation with you so that they can fill in the answers to the questions. And that is far better. And they're, they're more likely to do that by the way than to have a blank slate because they can answer a question and they feel comfortable with that because they know what you need to know. They know what you need to ask them and they can answer those questions appropriately really interesting that people don't like to actually have a blank slate to work on. So little tip for you, if you haven't got a call to action on your LinkedIn profile, you definitely need to update it. Okay, fifth common mistake we see happening a lot and I will lay odds on it. If I asked you to put yes in the chat box, it's going to get overflowing in a moment. Who here, so you can put a yes because we're going to go for, we're going to go for interaction today, guys. 
put a yes in the chat box. If you've connected with somebody and then within a moment or a day or a week, you get them trying to sell you their stuff. Put a yes in the chat box if that's, oh yes, Beck, it drives me nuts too, right? Five this week on, I'm feeling your pain, honey. Don't we hate that, right? I want you to think about your connection, building your connections like opening an emotional bank account with your, with your connections, right? So at that point of connection here, we have a zero balance. Think of it like a bank balance, right? Except in this case, we're building trust. We're depositing trust into that account or we're withdrawing trust, right? So at that point of connection, we've got a zero balance. If we go in and promote our business, we go into overdraw. It's going to take a bit for us to build that trust back up. But if instead, instead of this part happening, at this point of connection, we add value, we're going to add a deposit. We're going to add some trust into that relationship. And there are ways that I'm going to share with you today that are going to help you do that easily and elegant. Are you excited? Put a hell yes if you're excited because I can't wait to share you that part. All right. So we're going to have some fun today. Hell yes, everyone. Good job. Right. Okay. The sixth common mistake I see, and I see this a lot, is abandoned profiles. Now, you may have been on LinkedIn for six or seven years, but you haven't updated that profile in a good three or four, right? And so your profile needs to be maintained. It needs to be cared for. It needs to evolve with your business, with your strategy, with your service, with your products, right? with your accreditations. And if you're a member of ILP, congratulations, you are in a great space because Kerry and the team, they do a great job of helping you continue to grow and to improve your skills and certifications so that you are more valuable as a coach, as a consultant, as a trainer, as a facilitator for those businesses that you are aiming to help, right? For the guests who are on here who know nothing about ILP, my advice is, you want to check out Kerry and the team. They've got a great thing going. But here's the thing. Refresh your profile. Improve that. Make sure that as your business evolves, your LinkedIn profile evolves, that you update that regularly and keep that going, okay? And I'm going to give you a whole heap of tips today on how to make your profile look super smart, okay? So stay tuned. All right. Our seventh common mistake and our last one in this part of what we're talking about is inconsistency. It's about that sporadic, yeah, I'm going to get frenetic and do all of these things on LinkedIn and then you get a bit despondent and depressed and you stop doing it and then it eases off and you don't do anything for about six months or even six years, right? And then you start to come back in. I'd really much rather that you do consistent activity and later on I'll tell you about how you can do LinkedIn in as little as 90 minutes a week with three key activities that I want you to focus on, okay? So we'll talk more about that later. But inconsistency is a really common mistake. And you'll find that you get, if you're going to be inconsistent, you'll get inconsistent results. But if you're consistent, you'll get better results and more of them. Okay. So what do these mistakes lead to? Well, low profile views, definitely low connection response, low to no leads, and a whole ton of frustration and doubt. So how can we change that? Let's move on. Here are the five critical shifts before we really dive into all our juicy content today. And I'm pretty sure some of you are already finding this content juicy and we're only a few minutes in. What are we, 24 minutes in? We're going we're gonna to rock today, okay? Here are the five critical shifts that I find most people need to make um, LinkedIn successful for you, okay? The first one is mindset. If your mindset around LinkedIn is in any way, shape or form negative, then that's going to reflect on the results that you get. And I'll give you a really good example of this. And it ties in to the second gift that I'm going to give you today as well. One of my marketing mentors, different one from the one with the, the ideal client avatar, but this one, James Shunko, he runs a company called Superfast Business. He has been saying for years how he hates LinkedIn, how all it is, it's full of spammers, people who, as we've just done the whole, yeah, I've had that. People who connect with you and sell them your, their, try and sell their stuff to you. He hates that too, by the way. He got really frustrated and just saw it as a big spammy place of people trying to promote themselves and that his ideal client wasn't on there. And we worked out very quickly that it was. But I said to him, James, give me an hour of your time and I promise you 
that this will shift how you look at LinkedIn. And the first thing I said to him is, what you focus on is what you will attract. So if you think LinkedIn is spammy, that is all that you will see, right? Because that's what we're activating in that subconscious mind of ours. Find spam, oh, there it is, oh, there it is again, right? But if we decide to flip that mindset and say LinkedIn is full of opportunity, then we will start to see that. So one of the, the most important critical shifts to success on LinkedIn is shifting your mindset to get new results, right? And I did a podcast with James one, one year after having that conversation with him. It was actually in April last year that I had that conversation with him. And if you go back onto the homepage of my website, and in this case, I want you to scroll right to the bottom of that homepage. So juliemason.com.au, and you will see a section that says, Julie has been featured in or on something like that. And I want you to find the super fast business logo. And I want you to click on that. And that will take you to the podcast that I did with James one year later. And he will explain the results that he got from applying what I'm going to teach you today. Is that cool? So plus I'll go in and it will be great. For those of you who are not ILP members, we're, Kerry's recording this specifically for ILP members. Everybody else, I'm sorry, you're going to have to take the notes today, guys. But if you aren't a member of ILP, Superfast Business Live podcast recording on the bottom of my website will give you a reminder of some of the things that I'm going over in today's lesson. Is that cool? Give me a, a thumbs up or a yes if that's cool, okay? All right. So let's move on to the second critical one. This is coming back again. I know I'm banging on about this a little bit, but it's so important to get super clear on your ideal client avatar. So definitely do that homework that I give you in that worksheet on my website. It's really valuable. And I'll give you an example of this. I've got a client in California. His name's Stefan. He is the co-author of a book called The Art of SEO, which is considered the Bible of uh, search engine optimization. Um, he is an internationally renowned and in-demand speaker on this topic. And his clients are multi-billion dollar companies that uh, want them to get, uh, want him to give them advanced SEO uh, strategies so that they can actually beat their competition on Google. So he's not your everyday SEO guru, right? He is really at the top of the trees worldwide in this field. And he came to me uh, saying, look, I'm really not attracting my ideal clients. They can only afford half of what I usually charge people. I won't go into what his fee structure is, but essentially they are not my ideal client and uh, they're frustrated and I'm frustrated because I'm attracting the wrong type. And so I said, please send me your ideal client avatar. Now thinking that, you know, he's this super duper search engine optimization guy that he would really be on top of this. But I was surprised that he sent me through this three line description that was really vague, okay? And I, I could see exactly from that, that that's why he wasn't able to attract with his marketing, his target audience. And so once we got super clear on that and we rewrote his ideal client avatar, which earned, it turned into about an A4 page and a half, um, uh, really detailing their fears, wants, needs, and frustrations, that client avatar also became our content guide for what we could really help post that would help our and attract our ideal clients to us as well. So really important that you do that homework. Okay, and that ties into once you know who your ideal client avatar is, applying the right strategy to attract them. Because if you're looking to sell an ebook, for example, or just a proper book, like a $30, $30 physical book, that strategy is going to be very different from attracting people who will pay you $10,000. You need to do a very different approach to that, to what you would do for a lower cost item. So you really have to think about your products and services, your ideal client avatar, and how they would want to be approached. And there is a great book that I would encourage you, if you do have a high price product and service, so your consultation or your 
training services are in that thousand, two thousand dollars and above, then you probably want to really refine your strategy of approach with that. So um, I would definitely encourage people to really think about the strategy. And I find that my clients generally fall into about four different strategies that I teach. And one of them will be generally the bees knees for that person. And we then just do a little bit of tweaking and refining to make sure it fits their ideal client avatar. So really think about the strategy. Think about your ideal client. How would they like to be approached? You kind of need to put your feet in their shoes and smoosh around a little bit to make sure that you're really understanding how they think and feel and what's going to work well for them and then reverse engineer that out. All right. <clears throat> and then, of course, define your sales process. This is huge. Um, a lot of us, when we're in business, we're really great at what we do, but we may never have been taught sales whatsoever. And so we don't have a really refined or defined process of how to take somebody from being a connection on LinkedIn or, or coming in from a lead off Facebook ads, for example, into how do we take them from a phone conversation to a meeting to a, you know, converting them into accepting our services and, and signing up with our programs, right? So really have a defined sales process that you can take people through and it will make it elegant for you and easy for you and it will make it really elegant for those people to go through as well. And in fact, I teach a process called the elegant sales process to my clients where we really develop that and give them the guiding on what to say and when to say it so that they're not preempting something, okay? It's really important that you have that process down pat. All right. And, and by the way, um, I have to say that um, over the 20 odd years, it's, it's now nearly 30 years that I've been in sales, 10 years online and 20 years in, in traditional, that I've invested a lot of time and energy um, into learning sales and I continue to do so. In fact, I'm reading a current book at the moment. I'm always reading book on, books on sales and investing in myself. And the current book that I'm reading at the moment, for those of you who can't see, is called The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Fantastic book, highly recommend it. It's called The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes, C-E-C-H-E-T-H-O-L-M-E-S. So invest into learning how to sell because we're not taught that at, at school. We're not taught that at university. And I, I know so many people like, if you can go and learn how to be a chiropractor and it will take you six or eight years of university. You learn how to be a chiropractor and whack and crack people as we like to call it, but no one teaches you how to sell. In that eight, six or eight years of university, you might be lucky if you're taught a week of how to sell or market, right? So you're not taught those skills and you're thrust out into the world with very little training. So invest in learning how to sell so that it isn't icky and, and you know, slimy and, and, you know, used car salespeople approach that you can do it elegantly and build trust. Okay, so thank you, Corrine. You've put the link up to Amazon. Uh, for Chet's book, really appreciate that. I love you guys. You are so super helpful. Fantastic. Okay. The last tip that I've got, uh, the last shift in being successful on LinkedIn is to find somebody who can train and support you in this. And, and I applaud every one of you for investing three hours today through the courtesy of, of Kerry and ILP to come on and learn this because that is the first step in, in success. So thumbs up. Well done, you guys, for doing that. Okay. Now, we've kind of covered a little bit of ideal prospect, but one of the things that I just want to touch on is really digging into the fears, wants, needs, and frustrations. And here's why. In sales, people buy on emotion and justify with logic. And it doesn't matter if you are the CEO of a multinational corporation or a, a solopreneur or that you're the, you know, um, the uh, uh, procurement manager for a company, it doesn't matter. 
we buy on emotion and we justify with logic. And so I'm going to explain how this works and we're going to have a bit of fun with this, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I want, I want to ask everybody here a question. I'm not sure how many, how many have we got on the call at the moment? Um, you know, Michelle, can you just pop it in the chat box for me? Um, that would be great. But for everybody, I want you to just pop in the chat box. When, when I ask this question, I want you to pop in the answer. The question is, what do women love to buy? Okay, everyone, ch jump into the chat box. Okay, shoes, shoes, clothes. Watch, clothes, shoes, handbags, clothes, clothes, clothes. At, right, 56 attendees, fantastic. Plants, somebody's a gardener. Clothes, shoes, right. Shoes is usually one of the first things that comes up and you guys have, have absolutely nailed that. That was the answer I was looking for, but clothes and everything else is right as well, okay? We love to shop as ladies, right? But I want to come to shoes for a moment and I want to ask just the ladies on the call for a moment so, guys, I want you to listen, pay attention. You're going to learn something about your, your partners in a moment. But for right now, for the ladies on the call, do we buy shoes on an on a emotional basis or on a logical basis? So pop in, emotional or logical? Ah, yes, emotional. Thank you uh, for everyone. Oh, and, and Neil, I, I can't say that word. I'm sorry. Emotional. Okay, logical, Gail said, both. From Debbie, okay. Logical as I'm not a shoe buyer, says Janine. Okay, so I want to I want to address this for a moment. I want you to really think about this because you've got to think about this with your ideal clients, right? <coughs> when we are uh, when we buy shoes, we buy shoes. Uh, uh, so I'll give you an example. I had a a client who's a bookkeeper in Sydney, <clears throat> and I asked her this question. She said, "I buy them purely logically." They need to be comfortable, hard wearing and utilitarian. And I said, great, gum boots are utilitarian, comfortable and do all of that. Why are you not buying gum boots? And she went, oh, because they don't look good. Okay, you've won me. So, <laughs> right. So at some point there will be an emotional connection that you will have even logically with shoes. You, some shoes look excuse my language, but bloody ugly on your feet, right? You could look like clodhoppers in them. So at some point, we are going to have an emotional response to how they make us look and feel. And when we buy the right pair of shoes, it will raise our self-esteem, it will raise our self-confidence, and we will feel better about ourselves for them. Even if it is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, I've been talking since eight o'clock this morning, so it's going a long day today. <clears throat> it will be even if it is that we saved money on them, there will be an emotional response because we've had the thrill of saving money, right? Now, guys, now it's your turn. We've had the ladies answer that. Now I'm coming to the gentleman on the call. Guys, when your lovely partner comes home with her new shoes and she says, honey, look at my new shoes, <clears throat> what's the one thing you're going to ask her? Pop it in the chat box now while I have a drink of water. <laughs> Come on, you've got it, right? <clears throat> Guys, you are, you are just, ref oh, did you need another pair, Adam? Good one. <laughs> Your wife obviously buys two for the price of one. <laughs> Why didn't she buy two? John, I want to marry you. Why didn't she buy two pairs? That's awesome. My husband has never in 28 years asked that question. So Kerry's agreeing, no, nope, never, right? So John, John, you're going to do well with the ladies here. But um, yeah, well, the biggest question they're going to ask is how much? Now, here is where logic comes in. Because as a woman, I've bought many pair of shoes over the years and I always come home and say, honey, look at my new pair of shoes. And he goes, yep, how much did that cost? Well, it doesn't matter. They were on sale or I had to buy them because I've got this speaking gig or I'm going to a wedding and I need them to match my outfit. Do you see how we then justify our emotional purchase with logic to justify that purchase? There will be that, that process will happen with every single one of your clients. Does that make sense? Now, I'm giving you this to remind you in a fun way how that process works. And by the way, I was very nervous when I first got married because my husband had 
a ton of money in the bank. And he came with a 32 column budget book because we didn't have Excel spreadsheets back then. <laughs> I had a bank card that was maxed out. So I thought it was an economical match made in heaven when we got married. So I was really intimidated by his prowess of saving money. And so I used to keep a red pen in the glove box. And if those shoes weren't on sale when I bought them, damn it, they were when I got home. <laughs> but aside from that, now I don't worry about that, right? But back then I was a bit nervous. I had to get over that mindset. So coming back to our point, I want you to remember that every purchase for your services, your products, somebody is going to go through an emotional process that they're going to justify with logic to maybe their manager, to their CEO, to justify why they need to invest in your particular product, service, training, you know, programs, whatever it might be. And you need to understand what motivates them in that. Is this helpful, everyone? If it is, please let me know in the chat box now before we move on. Okay, I'm waiting for you. Fantastic. Okay, great. All right, because if it's not, I can stop now. <laughs> Kerry would go, no, don't do that. <laughs> All right, so let's dive into the power profile. Okay, so I want you to think about your prospects as going on a journey through your profile, okay? And they're going to start at your imagery, come down to your headline and your about section or what used to be called your summary, into your experience, down to your skills and into your credibility with your recommendations, okay? So I want you to keep thinking of them as tutoring along a little bit of a road and they're seeing all these amazing little points along the journey, is that cool? So with that being said, let's start to go through the very stop, top of your profile and we're starting with your imagery, all right? So one of my clients, JB or Justin Bayless, he's been a, a long-term friend of ILP and Kerry. Um, so I've used him as the example here. I wanna share with you how a really good profile looks. And I'm using JB's one here. You won't mind me using it. You want a really clear background. You wanna look directly at the camera. You definitely wanna smile. It doesn't have to be a forced smile or an unnaturally smile, but you wanna showcase good energy. And I'll, on that point of smiling, I'll give you a really good example of this. A couple of years ago, I was speaking at the, the um, Queenslanders Cricketers Club in at the Gabba. And I'd been presenting on LinkedIn and I, a guy came up to me afterwards, a really lovely, handsome guy came up to me afterwards and said, Julie, can you help? I have been, again, he'd been um, made redundant. He was looking for an opportunity for work and, I, and he just wasn't getting any callbacks. And I said, look, tell me what, what's happening. What do you do? And he said, I'm a forensic accountant and auditor. <laughs> I just went, oh, you know, it's a, it's a bum clenching kind of a title, isn't it? We just, we, we just, just don't want to have those type of people work for us or do anything with us, right? Because it's a scary factor, forensic accountant and auditor. And I, and I went, okay, amazing. Um, he told me more about what he did and, I, and the value proposition that he presents to people. And I said, well, let me jump on and have a quick look at your profile. Now, clearly this is a man who did not like having his photo taken because he balked her and he admitted that. And I said, honey, you already scare people with what you do, but your photo, you look like you woke up and suck a bowl of lemons for breakfast. You've got the Grinch look going on on your photo and no one wants to work with that. So guys, think about the energy that you're conveying with your photo. A smile conveys across a phone call and a smile conveys across your photo as well. So make sure that you smile, okay? And then have a clear background. Make sure it's undistracting. We want to build trust. So having anything distracting you behind you is going to take away their attention from looking at your eyes and your face. And from the time we were born, we look at people's eyes to determine are they going to nurture us or are they going to harm us, okay? 
So make sure the focus is coming to your face, okay? Not to the background that you've got. Don't try and get your banners in there and your logos in there. I don't want that. I want you to be fully in, into who you are and build that trust factor. Dress appropriately for your, your target audience. So if your target audience um, dresses in a suit and tie, then dress in a suit and tie. If your target audience is smaller businesses that tend to dress in polo shirts and, and you know, so forth, then have a branded polo shirt. But, you know, dress according to your target audience. I do encourage you to invest in professional photography because they can get rid of the shadows and they can clear up your skin and make you look, you know, 10 years younger, let's face it. Um, I'm not saying do the glamour photography. I'm not saying look 20 years younger. Hell, I had a photographer do that. And I said, please put my wrinkles back in because I'm 52 years old. This is who's going to show up when I present. I'm going to freak them out if I look 20 and show up 50. It's not going to work, right? And of course, um, I do encourage you to use a makeup artist and hairdresser. And the reason for that, for ladies, you want to look your best self, right? If you change your hairstyle, and I do regularly, if you see on my website, last year I hit menopause, right? I got hot flashes and I was looking for any way to get rid of that. So I perm my hair. Yes, I reinvented the 80s and perm my hair. And this year, I just couldn't go through that four hour perming solution again. And let me tell you, it hasn't changed in 20 years. So I cut it all off and went short and straight again, right? Still better for the hot flushes than anything else, let me tell you. But you've got to update your professional photography accordingly or your photo on your, your um, profile accordingly. For the guys, if the last time you looked good was it in your 1975 yearbook when you had hair and it's black and white photo, and I have seen this, by the way, not by anyone here. I'm not pointing fingers to anyone here, but I have seen this on LinkedIn please don't use your 1975 yearbook photo. It doesn't work. Be real, be authentic, show up as you, okay? Just own it. That's who we are. Own, our, own everything, right? Okay. So once you've got your, uh, and by the way, on this point, your background image is really important as well. I haven't put that in here today, but your background image Use this as a great opportunity to put your value proposition in here as well, because it does show up. So, um, so yes, definitely um, update your imagery accordingly. And if you don't want your imagery to be about you, find a background image that connects with what you do, right? So if you're in, in bookkeeping or accounting, then you could use some, some imagery that showcases bookkeeping, for example. Um, if you work in the manufacturing sector as your ideal client, then your, your ideal clients will automatically be attracted to a manufacturing image because they'll relate to that. So you'll grab their attention, right? We're coming into the second critical part of your profile and that's your headline. And your headline actually follows you everywhere on LinkedIn. And there are some mistakes that people make around this. So I really want to dive in on this. It, it follows you everywhere. So when you are, this is me with curly hair, you can see, there you go. Um, <laughs> it's a screenshot from before. Um, but when you connect with people, your, your name, your profile photo and your headline will show up. When you post something on LinkedIn, your name, your profile photo and your headline will show up. It follows you everywhere. In fact, it's also cached on Google, and, and this is the scary thing, guys, when people go to do business with you or, or look to hire your services, they actually will search you on Google. And Google tell us that 92% of people will look up your, your business and your name before actually handing over money. And your LinkedIn profile will rank incredibly high for your name on the first page of Google. And if it ranks number one, and that's the first place that people will click on to see who you are, imagine if your profile hasn't been updated, what kind of impression they're going to leave. That first impression counts, guys. 
So make sure that, and this is really tying in why it's so important to get your profile updated and how to do that effectively because it is one of those first impression click points for people. Um, most LinkedIn users make the mistake of putting their title, company and, and et cetera. So example, director at XYZ or sales manager at Abracadabra, Proprietary Limited, for example. But this doesn't tell them how you can help them. So what is the value? Tie that into the problem that you solve for your ideal clients and how do you fix that for them? All right. So I love value proposition, but I'm going to give you some technical things and then I'm going to give you some examples of great headlines. Are you ready? So let's get through the technical first. So on the desktop, when you update your LinkedIn profile on a, a laptop or a desktop, you've got 120 characters with which to do that. But if you do it on your mobile app, on your LinkedIn app, and I don't have my mobile phone near me at the moment, you can extend that to 240 characters. So you can actually build that out a little bit more and really showcase that value proposition. Use capitals at the beginning of every word because it will take it from being a sentence and, and not having a lot of power to it to making it this headline statement. So make sure that you use capitals at the beginning of every word on your headline. And I'm not saying all caps, just the capitals at the beginning of every word, right? And it will change it into a power statement. Speak to your ideal prospect. Again, you know, we're really talking about that ideal prospect and we will continue throughout today because it's fundamental to your success across the whole board of your business, right? Not just LinkedIn, but across the board. So speak to your ideal prospect and really think about those fears, wants, needs, frustrations, but the main problem that you solve for them. And if you can, squeeze in a couple of keywords into that um, value proposition that your prospects may search for, right? And lastly, if you really want to add a little bit of flavor, you, can, you, you could use a sprinkling of emojis like a smiley face or a tick, for example. I love the ticks, you know, the green tick or a blue tick or something like that. But please don't use too many of them. Don't go heavy handed on emojis. In fact, I wrote a whole LinkedIn article on tips on using emojis on LinkedIn that's backed up by some scientific research. And I'll share that with you. Did you know, and you can put a yes or no or, or a wow when I finish this, did you know Scientific research shows that the same parts of our brain light up when we see an emoji as when we see a real human face. Put a wow if that blows your mind in the chat box, right? The same parts of our brain light up when we see an emoji as when we see a real human face. Oh my God, right? Phenomenal. So you can use emojis on LinkedIn and I would highly encourage you to go and read that article. It will give you a ton of advice. I call it use the salt test. A little sprinkling of salt in your cooking gives flavor. Too much ruins the dish. Use the salt test when using emojis, right? That's the perfect analogy. Okay, so go and check out that article as another one. But here's some great examples where you can show some personality and how you can um, add value to people. Now, these are short, concise ones, but you can do longer ones. And I love these ones. These just make me smile when I read them. Ryan Miller, orchestrator of awesome experiences at WebConnex. Immediately, I want to connect with him because I want an awesome experience. Right? I have no idea what WebConnex does, but... Hell, I want to do some of that. Justin Kent, changing the world one app at a time, right? I love that one too. It's a great one. Because it tells about what his passion is and also that he can help you with, you know, your app development, for example. Barbara, strategy consultant and executive coach. Let's find clarity, make a plan, Get it done. I, that's really a value proposition. She talks about what it is she does and then how she does it. And that's a beautiful framework, right? Adam Colley, international communications. This is really a positioning one. 
Australia's number one commercial language consultant, right? So he's really talking about if you're looking for international communications, I'm your guy, but I'm also Australia's number one commercial. So he's niche. He's not a language consultant broad, which is where you go niching into that ideal client avatar. He's niched as a commercial language consultant. So a couple of examples that I can give on here. Warren Kruger, highly recommend checking out his profile because we redid his headline and literally within an hour of making the change, he got a new client on LinkedIn because he's, he does, he's in Western Australia. He specializes as a personal tax consultant. He doesn't do business tax, just personal tax. And he said, um, I help, I was something like personal tax consultant, helping you pay the correct tax and not a penny more, right? So, by that, by that wording, not a penny more, he's using the language of his ideal target audience, which is a more mature language because the millennials wouldn't know what a penny is if it hit them in the face, right? So he's talking with a language that speaks to his ideal audience as well. So think about that too. Charlene's just asked a question. What are the benefits of using keywords over a sentence as a headline? Which one is preferable? Personally, I love a, a sentence that showcases the value proposition rather than just a string of keywords. Because naturally, as readers, we read as a sentence, not as a as keyword, keyword, keyword. So I always prefer, um, you know, more of a, a sentence structure than a headline. Showcase that that it flows, that it has con continuity in your writing. Um, Corinne, you are amazing, my love. How cool are you for just popping up all of those resources for me? Huge. Look, thank you to Corinne. That's awesome. Thank you so much. She worked as a journalist for 30 years. I need you. I need to hire you, honey. You should come on to all my, all my webinars. God, love you. That's awesome. Okay. So some mistakes that we find. Uh, okay. What we're going on to now is the about section. So this flows directly underneath your, uh, your headline kind of thing. We go into what's now called the about section. And there are some big mistakes that people make with this. So I wanna start with that. And then I'm gonna give you the exact step-by-step -step formula, paragraph by paragraph guys, with examples of how to write this, okay? Oh my gosh, it's so exciting. Right, so the first mistake people make with their about section is that it's too short or non-existent. This is a great opportunity for you. Remember, we're changing our mindset on LinkedIn to it's full of opportunity. And this is what I call your silent salesperson on LinkedIn. It's gonna do the heavy lifting for you guys. So we definitely wanna, we wanna get this right. So make sure that your about section is really fleshed out. And you've got about 2,600 characters with which to do that. Um, so 2,600 characters with which to do that. And Con has put Corrine's profile up. Good on you, Con. She deserves that shout out. Good on you. So you definitely want to really flesh out and use this, those 2,600 characters as much as you can. The second mistake I see is it's written all about you and not about the value that you offer to an organization or to your ideal client, you know, that client avatar that we've been talking so much about. And thirdly, there's no clear call to action at the end. So we definitely want to adjust that. And in the formula that I'm going to give you, we're going to cover it in detail. Are you ready? Okay, pens at the ready, here we go. Okay, I'm going to give you the quick overview. It's, it's, this is paragraph by paragraph. Identify, aggravate, solve, proof of solution, credibility, call to action. And now I'm going to move into the next slide and you're going to go, oh, don't, but I'm going to break this down every step of the way. Okay, so here we go. Step one, the identifying par paragraph is to help your ideal clients identify that you're talking about them. What is the, so we write this as what is the problem that you solve for your potential, in this case, I put potential employers, but potential clients, okay? So the example that I've got here is building and maintaining success. If you're a business coach or you're a financial coach, I think the example on this one is it's a financial coach. 
we're going to talk about what are the problems that they have. So building and maintaining a successful business in today's rapidly changing environment is a balancing act. And we've written this recently. So it's talking about everything that's going on with COVID without actually putting COVID in there, right? Because we don't want to actually put COVID in there. It's, a, it's actually a turn off nowadays, guys, than, than putting it in. Okay. So we want to identify what's the problem. So for example, for me, um, I talk about lead generation on LinkedIn. And so the problem that people have is that they're trying to use LinkedIn to generate leads, but they don't have a clear strategy. And so they're getting frustrated and, and they're really thinking LinkedIn's a complete waste of time. So I'm addressing what is the problem that I solve? I'm putting that in a, in a, in a conversational tone. And, and on that note, guys, I see a lot of people ask the question, do you, uh, is your business X, Y, Z? You know, do you suffer from this problem? Are you needing to train your clients or your staff in this area? And while questions are great, um, as Neil Rackman says in Spin Selling, which is a great sales book, by the way, it's probably one of the top five that I've read in sales books over the last 30 years. Uh, by the way, that's, I'm sure Corrine's going to have the link up for Amazon in no time flat, but it's Spin Selling by Neil Rackman. Um, he talks about those questions being situational questions. And people get really tired of situational questions because they're expecting you to have done your research and know that. And again, that comes back to doing your ideal client avatar, knowing what the fears, wants, needs, and frustrations are, et cetera. So definitely want to make sure that you are, you know, not doing too many questions in your, your about section. If you have, I'm going to suggest a rewrite might be in order, okay, just to reframe them. And it's easy to reframe a question and put it into a, a contextual sentence. And I, Kareem's a, a journalist. She'd be brilliant at asking for help on that. So I'm sure I'm giving you a shout out, Kareem. You're amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, and Kareem's already put the link for Spin Selling for Neil Rackman into the chat box for anyone who wants it. Kareem, I love you. You are just brilliant. Thank you. All right. So moving on from there, we've got to go into step two. Now think of these as paragraphs that you're going to write. And I call this step two the aggravate step, which is what is it costing your prospective clients? Please ignore employees here. I forgot to change that from another presentation I did, but it doesn't matter if it's employees or, or uh, clients, your, your leads, your prospects. What is it costing them to have that problem? And think about it. Is it costing them financially, emotionally, physically? It could even be costing them spiritually in terms of their peace of mind, their sense of calm, their zen, for example. Remember, people buy on emotion and justify with logic. We've gone through that with that whole shoe example, right? Um, and so spin, um, by the way, there's a question there. What does spin mean? Um, spin is actually the process of questions you ask in the sales process. So it, it's an anacronym for situational questions, identifying questions, etc., and needs analysis question. I can never remember what the P stands for. I'm sure somebody will look it up and let me know, but it's situational, skip the P, but, but there is P, I think it's positioning, I'm not sure. Then, um, then, uh, then it's needs analysis at the end. So you've got an idea. That's what SPIN is an acronym for. It's not about, um, twisting or spinning things out to suit you. It's actually a sequence of questions that you need to ask in your sales process. And that ties into what you can do with elegant selling, if that makes sense. So definitely a great book, highly recommend it. Okay, so again, let's use the example here. Um, for example, with our financial advisor here, um, he's really talking about sustaining year-on-year -year growth while keeping up to date with commercial and legislative compliance and managing the challenges of daily business operations place huge demands on business owners and directors. So again, can you see how he's identified who he's targeting here and what are the problems if he, they don't have a financial advisor that they're going to come up with, right? So you definitely want to put into place that 
emotion justified with logic? What is it costing them to have this problem? All right. Then we move into, we can't leave people in hell. We have to move them out of that pretty quickly. So we're going to move into the solution paragraph. What is this overarching solution to the problem? Lead them into how you can help them, right? So in this case, the example is partnering with a financial business advisor. You can gain years of experience that can help you to supercharge your outcomes, right? So we're really talking about the overarching solution not the methodology of how you work, but the overarching solution. And by the way, in this paragraph, you can even bring in some great statistics or data to that as well. You know, around, thank you, Adam, situational problem, implication, need, payoff, fantastic. So um, you can bring into this some statistics to back up that solution, right? Which then segues beautifully into step four proof of that solution. Has this solution worked for other people? What outcomes could be expected from doing these, uh, this solution? So for example, we've got here uh, with our financial advisor, we're just following through with that example. We help to identify areas negatively affecting profitability and growth, develop bold solutions that meet your unique needs, act as a sounding board and provide comprehensive strategies that address issues affecting your business that can help you reduce risk, accelerate growth and make better informed decisions. Now that is a long paragraph, but it's really valuable because it talks not only about the solution, but it really delves into the areas that that solution can work into, right? Okay, moving on to step five, credibility. Why should they trust you to solve this problem for them? What's your experience, your unique selling proposition? That's what USP stands for, for those who aren't familiar. Your unique selling proposition. What, what is unique for you, for example? What makes me unique? I've had this question many times compared to the plethora of LinkedIn experts out there is that I'm pretty darn sure that there's not too many LinkedIn experts worldwide who have done 15 years in door-to-door -door cold calling. Pretty sure that ain't happening out there. So I know that makes me unique from that perspective, right? So everything that we do here, and by the way, this formula that I'm teaching is not something that I created. This is an age old, it's over a hundred year old marketing formula that has been used very effectively to sell countless trillions of dollars worth of products and sales over the years, over the last hundred plus years. I've just worded it to fit LinkedIn. Does that make sense, everyone? So why should they trust you? And our example here is over the years, I've worked within businesses to reignite the passion, the purpose of the business while rigorously challenging the operations to discover new opportunities and eliminate waste. I took a large motor vehicle dealership from a loss of 1.5 million to a profit of 2.7 million within 18 months by realigning the business with their purpose, eliminating wasted nice to have resources and focusing on providing services that have a positive profit margin. With a long list of successful business transformation, I'm ideally placed to discuss your business and personal goals and work on the alignment of those goals, diagnose the illness your business is suffering from and prescribe the solution to fix those issues and guide you to your ultimate success. I love the wording in this one as well, right? So um, definitely look at how your, and this site kind of segues in a proof of solution. We've put in that middle paragraph there, a little bit more proof of the solution of hiring this person and wrapped it all up with credibility, right? So definitely highlight that. Um, and, and this will be the biggest challenge for all of you because we tend not to, particularly for us in Australia, we tend not to toot our own horn too much. It's that whole tall poppy syndrome, right? So we tend not to toot our horn so much. And so we get a little bit, you know, reticent to showcase the value that we have and the credibility that we bring to the table. And I definitely work with clients to help write this for them if that's something that you're super challenged with today at the moment. 
We can have a discussion about that. But if not, see if you can do the best you can with this formula. I've found that my clients over the years, teaching this to thousands of people over the years, find it really helpful to actually write out their profile much better. And then lastly, the last paragraph is what is the call to action? What's the next step to, to getting in contact with you? What's the next step to, you know, to doing business with you? Should you phone, email, visit your website? And of course, remember, email, lowest, poor, poor, poorest converting call to action known to man. Don't ask for that one. But you could, if you were laying it out this way, if you're looking for someone to walk with you in your business journey who understands the challenges and who's provided the way forward, then reach out today and you've got phone number and email and it gives people a choice. I found personally, this is my personal preference, that I just simply say, if you're looking for uh, help with your LinkedIn strategy, um, uh, simply give me a call on 04 dot, 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 dot uh, today and I'll look forward to seeing if and, I, if and how I can help you um, and, and wrap it up at that. So that's the fastest call to action is giving them your phone number um, and it will be the easiest one for people to do. So highly recommend that as an option there for you. So that is our formula for how to write your profile um, for the about section. And I'm gonna quickly go live onto LinkedIn and show you that top half to start with. So I'll just pop that off there and pop over onto my profile and show you how this looks so you can see. So we've got our imagery that we've talked about. We've got our headline here however that works for you. We then come down into this about section. That's this section here that we're talking about. And by the way, guys, if you're not connected with me already on LinkedIn, please do so. I would love to support you moving forward past today. So I'm definitely going to pop this into the chat box so you can reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. Just send me a personal message and say that you were on the, the uh, call with Kerry and ILP today. So I know where you're coming from. That would be great. I'd love to, to continue to support you and answer any questions that might come up after this call. Um, so definitely do that. But you can see here, a little emoji works really nicely in highlighting some points in your about section as well, okay? Or you could even use the telephone emoji down the bottom if you're driving them to have a phone call with you. You could use the little telephone emoji down here too. So a sprinkling of emojis works really well in that section. And Kerry, I think right now, before we move on to the next section, this might be a good spot for us to have a 15 minute break and come back at 11.30. Then we can flow on to the next section. What do you think? I think it's a good idea. Just quickly before we break, Rachel had a question, which I thought was really interesting. Um, yep. um, if we can get some good L&D examples of our unique selling proposition and positioning. Yeah. So will we have time to do that today? Otherwise, we can take it offline and... Um, yeah, look, it. how about um, how about we have um, a 10-minute uh, break? Are you guys mm -hmm. going to be okay? Put a yes in the chat box for those of you I can't see. 10 minute break, go to the ladies, go to men's, whatever, get a cup of coffee, stretch your legs, breathe deep breath, answer some emails, whatever. And then um, I'd like somebody to, who is in the LMP um, that would like me to hot seat their profile. So how's that, Kerry? That sounds great. Right. <laughs> Hopefully someone will be game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's Rachel. Comments. I, I will be happy to hot seat. Rachel's already volunteered or Jennifer. <laughs> well, Rachel, I think we're volunteering Rachel. So Rachel, if I'm not connected with you, my love, you need to connect with me now. So I, or send me your, your URL. You've been volunteered or voluntold. You voluntold yourself. Um, let's have a break now. 10 minutes, guys. We'll be back and we're going to hot seat Rachel and um, I'll show you how to do it from for the ILP community, for the LMP community. For those of you who aren't on that community, that's great, but definitely take this moment to check out Kerry and her, her group. Um, Michelle will probably put up the link for the website, for um, the ILP website or Kerry, can you do that? That would be great. Great. Okay.
Fantastic. And mm -hmm. and Rachel, make sure that you've got your link to me so I can I can have a look at that and we can hot seat you very shortly. Okay, great. Right. See you in 10. All right, thank you. You in the best possible way, right? Um, so when we look off camera or uh, we have, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, sunglasses on or something like that, that obstructs our view of the eyes. It reduces down the trust that we can build. So I would encourage you to get, if you've got a professional photo, definitely update that. And your background, while it's great that it showcases our beautiful native uh, flora and fauna, I would encourage you to put something here that's a little bit more professional in regards to, you know, um, emotional intelligence. And there's some amazing things that you can do using Canva nowadays um, to create some great images. Have you used Canva at all, Rachel? I'm no. looking over this way because I've got videos on that screen and you're linked in over here. So I'm a little bit all over, sorry. Have you used Canva? Are you, do you do um, graphics at all on Canva, Rachel? No, I haven't. Okay, so if you haven't tried Canva anybody, this program, you can use it for free. I've put it in the chat box for everyone. It makes me look like I'm a graphic designer and I suck at graphics. <laughs> it's a great free tool, highly recommend. And they have a, a pre-designed template for LinkedIn banners. So it's really easy to use, okay? All right, so a couple of things here. Um, definitely your name, I would suggest that you just change it to your name only. And the reason for this, this might come up a lot. Some LinkedIn, some LinkedIn uh, experts say, put in what you do, put in some keywords and stuff into this space, but it's actually screws up the search results and people don't know first name, last name. And if they go to tag you in a post, for example, and they just want to tag your first name, they've got to backtrack through all of that as well. So your name on LinkedIn's terms and conditions should just be your name. The emotional intelligence and job interviews coach belongs in where? Your headline. headline. Yeah, okay. So your name just stays as your name and this part here needs to come down into that uh, headline area. And again, your value proposition is really not showcasing what it is that you do. Having read, sped read through your profile and at least one article during this break <laughs> and all your recommendations for the first seven, um, you've got some massive value to offer, right? So I'm just going to bring that video across here a little bit. Here we go. Um, so essentially, so I can see you there, Rachel, without twisting my head around a little bit. So essentially, uh, a headline that I would do for you is along the lines of helping um, uh, helping team, companies and teams to improve communication and self-management through emotional intelligence. Read my profile to find out more. Mm. How does that sound? Yeah. Um, is it sufficient to say to improve communication? Because that doesn't seem very specific. Well, you can, you can expand on that, but I'm, okay. I've only got a short time for the whole thing. Yeah, no, no. So, and I, I sped read through and I'm trying to retain as much of it <laughs> <laughs> while no, I think. Well, I think creatively on the spot at the same time. No, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> so um, um, improve on that. You've got, remember if you updated on the desktop here, you've only got 120 characters. But if you get your mobile phone and go onto your LinkedIn app, you can expand that up to 240 characters. And it really allows you to delve in a little bit more on those areas that you benefit your ideal client with make sense yeah remember and, and one of the things that you get an immediate tick for is that you've got a, a capital at the beginning of every word already keep that going when you redo this okay that will be really important all right your about section it does need a little work but i have to say 
that your current experience, if I just zoom down to your current experience and expand this one here, this is really beautifully written. And, and it talks about um, more around, you know, how you help people. You help to build that emotionally resilient and intelligent organization and team. And people develop new skills that can be used immediately. It's engaging, practical, down the earth and evidence-based, right? But what I wanna ask you here, coming back to our about section, how do your ideal clients present? When they come to you, what is the main problem that they present with? Does it make sense? Yep. So um, can you answer that? <laughs> Um, that's what I always struggle with. So I think um, that often, well, some of them just simply want to get on better with other people. So I work with senior leaders and professionals and they're struggling to motivate their teams or they're getting frustrated or they're sent to me because they're upset, like one client's upsetting his team and not yeah. getting on and is perceived as negative. So they have to overcome a negative impression and negative communication oh my god rachel you are so lucky this is being recorded because you just wrote your identify paragraph <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right so um so that is that is perfect for identifying and for anybody who's listening the trick here to work out how you word this is go back and think about those conversations those initial conversations you have with your your clients that you already are working with and think about how do they present what are they describing as the problem from their language that you're they're hiring you to help them with does that make sense everyone for everybody who's listening put a yes in the chat box if that makes sense that's the real real lovely little trick is to go back and think about how do your ideal your actual dream clients that you're working with now how do they present? What's the language that they talk about their problems with, right? And that helps enormously. Then we move into that aggravate paragraph. Uh, Rachel, what I want to ask is what is it costing them to have these communication issues or, or it's a, it's a um, you know, um, They've got a, a, a member of, you know, the executive team who just doesn't get on with everybody and causing angst. What kind of costs will incur from that? Um, it varies incredibly. That's one of my problems, but it could lead to a loss of employment at a director level. Mm -hmm. um, if they're screwing up the whole of the culture, um, it could just lead to staff employees not being willing to follow direction or it could just mean that they're emotionally Which in turn would lead stressed. to low productivity wouldn't it that would in turn lead to low productivity yeah uh, it would lead to higher staff turnover as well which is very costly financially then yeah yeah it would lead to at, at the very end i'd probably put as a, at a director level it could even lead to loss of employment or loss yes. of employment, right um, and I wouldn't lead with that, but I would put, at, 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 even at the worst case scenario, it could lead to loss of employment um, if this, you know, but, but look at it, at the cost that it's, it's attributing to the company, yeah? So um, it, would be, um, it would be low productivity, higher staff turnover, it would be um, contentious issues being currently brought to, perhaps even the next level of management, which makes their productivity, they're constantly putting out fires and, and trying to get the culture back on track, or it's even just nosediving the culture internally completely, right? Constantly putting out fires is excellent. Thank you. You're very welcome. See, I can spell ice to Eskimos. <laughs> Okay, and then what we want to do is we want to ease into that solution. And I think I would, I would be, I didn't have time to look at your website per se, but I would be looking at some of the things that you've described on your website, even down further in, uh, in this area here. This is a great uh, example of what you could do around, you know, the proof or the solution. The solution is 
We help, and I would start here because we don't want to do an ad too early into it. We help you build an emotionally resilient and emotionally intelligent, and you may even want to put emotionally stable organization and team. Mm. That's a good one too that you can that add is. in there, right? At the moment, that's brilliant. Exactly. Okay. And we help people develop new school skills that could be, I would rather it used, implemented immediately would be nice. Implemented immediately. And the process is engaging, practical, uh, practical down to earth and evidence based. So that also builds, you know, so we're talking now, we're easing into how that proof of solution works. And we could talk more about you know, um, we could talk more about the statistics behind that, you know, that you draw on the emotional intelligence research of pioneers such as Peter Salovey, John Mayer, and leading research, Australian researchers such as Professor Stow at Swinburne, et cetera. Do you know, you could use that as proof that this solution is, is working and that there's some really scientific backed stuff. It's not woo-woo, in other words, right? <laughs> made Kerry laugh with a woo-woo comment. <laughs> All right. And then you would ease in. So at the top, at the moment, you're talking all about you. Do you see how this is written with I am, yeah. I have, I do, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, I also have. And then you're talking all about, and, and again, oh my goodness, bowing down to your amazing credibility here. You have got bucket loads of it, truck loads of it, my love, but they're not necessarily buying that. They want to know that you understand exactly where they are at this point in time, that you understand that there is a way through that, what it's costing them, that there's a way through this, that you have the credibility and skills to get them through. And here's the next step, right? Is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and a great tip actually comes through uh, the about section for your profile at the moment is very busy to read when we do this in a bullet point like this um, that is really hard to read after a while all the, I call it eye blur when we do big chunky blocks of text and we don't put enough white spacing it is hard for the eye to read so perfect you know um, but I would I would try and write this more in a conversational tone we tend to read things better when it is conversational tone. Even if we put in a couple of little bullet points, like I've done in my about section, I've written those bullet points in conversational tone. Does this make sense? Yeah, I used to have it like that and I couldn't fit in what I wanted to say. So I went to <laughs> bullet points and I can see it's not very good. I know, but remember with the formula that I've given you here for everybody listening, you're not trying to chuck in everything we're not trying to give people a tsunami of information all we want at this point in the process is for them to understand we understand who they are what the problem they're facing is what it's costing them there is a solution and if you'd like to know how i can help you with my credibility come on board I, here's the next step does it make sense and one of the things that I love about your profile, Rachel, in particular, is that down here in the experience, you really fleshed this out. And this is perfect for your experience section because you're really talking about this is how I can help you. You can actually really give more time to the services and products in your ex current experience than trying to shove it all into the about section. And in fact, here's the light bulb moment for everybody on the call. Are you ready? Dum, 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 dum. You can have more than one current experience. So for example, I have multiple current experiences. I've got one for mentoring. I've got one for speaking as a LinkedIn tutor at the University of Sydney. I've got one for my program, Link Sales Formula. I need to add another one for a new program I created for people looking for work called Position for Success. So I will create multiple current experiences that tie to the same company that basically talk about the different products or services that I have to offer. Does that help everyone? Please give me a hell yes in the chat box if that helps everyone. You can actually expand more about your 
because this is once they've read your about profile section, they can come down and they can go, oh, that's how Rachel can help me. Fantastic. Or that's how Adam can help me. Excellent. Right? Oh, good. We've got lots of hell yeses going in the chat box. Kerry, we're having a great time today on this call. Everyone's really loving it. I love the interaction, everyone. Thank you so much for showing up and playing full out with me. That's great. Rachel, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Very was, much. Was it, was it less, you know, Band-Aid ripping off than you thought it would be? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you've been very kind because you've gone to the description of the Institute, which in fact will be becoming defunct and I'm going as a solo operator and um so but it's really interesting that we've got it right there but not on my um about section so i'll i'll work on that that's been great thank you yeah and and yes kerry you're absolutely right this is how that ideal client avatar worksheet will really help and tie into that you know digging into those fears wants needs and frustrations of the ideal client avatar it allows you to write your about section and your, your product your, your product and service section with your current experience more effectively for people. So fantastic, thank you. Um, Dave has asked uh, about third person or first person statements. Great question, Dave. Thank you so much for asking. I personally prefer to write in first person as in, you know, um, myself, I am, I do kind of thing, rather than Julie did, Julie has, um, if I'm talking about myself, because I think there is a deeper level of connection that happens when I talk more personally than if I talk of myself as a third entity. So I really look at LinkedIn. Do you know, I don't think I've ever said it in these words before, but thank you, Dave, because this has been really helpful for me as well. When I'm on LinkedIn, I actually imagine that I'm actually having conversations, face-to-face -face conversations with people. So I write as if I'm having a face-to-face -face conversation as opposed to, and while I do have structure in here, it adds that conversational tone, which in turn builds trust, subconsciously builds trust, right? So I definitely think, you know, First person for me is my absolute preference. There's very few times that I would encourage my clients to write third person. And that is if we really have to position them in such a way to get, I don't know, let's say uh, they really want to get more media gigs. That's their outcome that they want. They want to be speaking on TV, et cetera. In that case, we need to really do an American version of that and pump them up a little bit more. And it's always difficult to say I have and, and really toot your own horn to that level. So from that, I would probably move to third person, but it's very rare that I would do that. I think when you're doing LinkedIn for lead generation and to build trust with your networking and your connections, I much prefer first person around that. So yeah, I and, and think about, on that point, guys, think about every time you connect with somebody, it's not this disconnected entity. Imagine them sitting in front of you. Think about them as a conversation that you're having. And a lot of my clients get really surprised at how short and friendly and chilled out my conversations are in my direct messages on LinkedIn. I really want to, to have that personal approach. So I hope that helps. Dave, yes, it does. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're going to just jump back into our uh, tips over here for a second um, with this about section and wrap this up. And then I'm going to give you some tips on the current experience and some formulas there to write that. So again, remember 2,600 characters. I would encourage you to use small sentences and paragraphs. We mentioned that that came up in the chat box conversation. Plenty of white space, guys, so that you can make it easy for your readers to read and your prospects to read, okay? Create a draft. Please don't try and do this live on LinkedIn. I never get, uh, I've been writing LinkedIn profiles for 10 years and I never get it right the first time. And I do this as a profession, right? So please do it on a Word doc. Make your changes and edits there. 
before even bounce it off somebody if you've got a mastermind group or you're a member of ILP and you're onto the you know, the regular programs that Kerry run when you can you know brainstorm each other use that as an opportunity perhaps Kerry you might do something like that in the next couple of weeks I'm not putting any pressure on you but that could be a great way for you to create you know some feedback before you put it live on LinkedIn okay and my favorite tool is lettercount.com to check the length. I know you can do it on Word, but I actually find that lettercount.com is so much easier to use. Um, and it, it's just go to lettercount.com, guys. You'll see how it, you copy and paste it in and it will check your, your character count exactly and you know exactly how many um, characters you've got left, okay? The experience section. Let's talk about the experience section here. Your current experience, again, we've talked that you can have multiple current experiences to showcase the different products and services, programs that you have. Um, that's really valuable. Make sure that you use that value proposition headline and, and add in a couple of keywords there. The difference is with a current experience, you only have a um, hundred characters for the headline on that, not 120. Um, like you do on the desktop and you can't expand it on the mobile app, unfortunately. So 100 characters on that, right? Um, you, here's a simple formula to write your current experience description. So you can break it down into these, uh, into these sections. The first paragraph, what I do. The second paragraph, who I serve. The third paragraph, how I do it. In other words, your, your methodology or how you work with people. The fourth paragraph is my style. So um, I, I loved how Rachel describes that this is friendly and fun, easy, engaging. I think it was engaging was a great word that Rachel used in, in her description. So talk about the style of how you work. For me, I am full on fun, friendly, love to have laugh. You know, um, I believe learning should be logical and simple. So I, I really work in a logical formulated way, right? But I make it fun at the same time. So it's my style, right? Um, and then uh, don't forget what's the next step. So you can see an example of this. I think there's one somewhere in my current experience. I see this formula used a lot elsewhere on LinkedIn as well. But for people who really get stuck, you can do that, okay? My advice is also use the about formula as well, but write it for your product and service. Um, you know, again, just rewording it for that specific product and service. But check out my profile. There's some good examples on there for you to use as a template um, and to inspire you on how to write it. Is that cool? Uh, Gail, this is for your personal LinkedIn not your page, okay? So everything we're talking about at the moment is to do with the personal LinkedIn. Great question, thanks for asking. Your past experience, by the way. Oh, and last tip on both current and past experience, you only have 1,800 characters to write the description. Your about section, you've got 2,600. Your um, experience section is a, a limit of 1,800. So just to confirm there with you as well. Current experience, uh, past experience, here we go. Use a keyword rich title. It's not as important to have a value proposition because this is your past. But what I want to talk to you about here is how you tie your past to your present and to your future and beyond. That's okay? Does that sound good? So how do we get our past experience? And I, I've had people who have gone from being a lawnmower man to being uh, working for Rico as a salesman and he says, but how do I, how do I talk about my past experience? I was a mower man. How's anyone, how, where's the credibility for that? So I'll give you that example, okay? And he was my first LinkedIn client 10 years ago, actually. It's really funny. He still, he still loves LinkedIn and uses it enormously today. But I said to him, okay, let's think about you being a mower man, because that's how he termed it. I said, was it your business? And he said, yes, I bought it with 35 customers and I sold it with 155. And I said, so you were the business development manager for that business. And he went, oh, was I? I said, yes, that's what we call salespeople. And he says, oh, I like that. And I said, did you hire people to help you when you got busy periods in busy seasons? And he said, yes. I said, well, not only were you the business development manager, but you were the senior technician. 
<laughs> I'm feeling pretty good about myself about now. I said, well, great, right? So it's about, you know, it's about taking your past and making it, you know, don't belittle yourself for what you did in, in the past. Your throughout your life, we rarely change our work ethic throughout our life, but our work, our career, the statistics tell us we will change between four to six defined times in our career. We will make four to six big changes, right? So who you are as a person still pretty much stays the same. They say Maya Briggs, for example, that doesn't much change over a 20 year period, right? So keyword rich headline, and here's the formula for writing it, paragraph by paragraph. Context, who did you work for? Be brief, we're not here to give them uh, an advertiseral pitch, we're just here to give a brief context around who you worked for. So, um, you know, you can see this in some of my past experience examples, um, but generally, you know, just talk about it was a, XYZ company that specialized in XYZ or ABC, for example. Second paragraph, what was your role and responsibilities? And again, we're writing this in conversational tone. Please do not just copy and paste your resume and dump it in with all your bullet points of the duties that you did. It's boring for HR people to read. And if it's boring for them to read and you to read, it's boring for everybody else. Interestingly, LinkedIn tell us that people who have at least five experiences listed and detailed on their profile are seen as more credible and more trustworthy than those that don't. So this is important, guys, okay? So talk about your role and responsibilities. And then I want you, this one's gonna stretch a few people out of their comfort zone. I want you to talk about what was your greatest achievement in that company? Not what your boss thought was your greatest achievement, but what you think was your greatest achievement. If it agrees with your boss, well and good. If it, if it was yourself, then what are you happy about? If it was a past business that you ran and you were really pleased with the achievements that you did in a particular area, be proud of those, put them there because it shows that you're proud of your work and people are more likely to hire people who are proud of their work, right? Makes sense, psychology, right? Okay, and then lastly, what are the skills that you learned in that job that help you serve your clients well today? What are the skills that you learned in that role that help you serve your clients well today? Okay, that ties your past to your present. Is that cool? Okay, so has everyone got that? I'm just leaving it there for you. Couple more seconds if you have yes in the chat box if that makes sense great um we want to move on we've got a lot more to continue and we've only got an hour and five minutes left ah <sighs> clear and succinct thank you you're welcome okay you so much homework now i know look anybody who comes to a linkedin workshop with me or or on these courses at the end of it your your gray matter will be leaking out your ears i know i'm sorry but i'm here to give you massive value today and to ensure that you know how to use linkedin so well that you are going to nail it okay that's what i want for you right okay let's move on in LinkedIn, you have this section on your profile called the skills section. I'm going to quickly go over to my profile for a second and show you where this is. And the cool thing with the skills section is it's about optimizing your profile for keyword search on LinkedIn. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going to come down to the uh, skills and endorsement section. And essentially, you can put up to 50 skill sets. So this is, as Charlene asked earlier, at the very early part, you know, is, is it better to do a sentence or put keywords into your headline? Well, this is where you really want to put your keywords in. This is optimizing your profile so that you can actually be found on these keywords. And you can add up to 50 of them. And the cool thing is you can edit these, you can click on this little blue pencil here and choose which one you want to be the top three that you really wanna put the spotlight on and be recognized for those particular ones. So for example, 
if I wanted to take marketing strategy off and put business strategy up or maybe take that off and put sales processes up, then I could simply unpin or pin them accordingly. Does it make sense? And then just simply save that. So really easy for you to optimize those as well and make sure that those top three are really, you know, the ones that you want to be known for. And come in and edit these from time to time. Previously, I used to teach SEO and do SEO for clients. No, I know I haven't done that for over six years. So that would be a skill I'd probably get rid of because I don't want to be found for SEO. It's not my core offering. Does it make sense? So update them like you would update your profile elsewhere. Okay, but we really want to talk more about recommendations. So I'm going to move out and we're going to scroll down here to the recommendation section. And both of these are key for credibility holders on your profile. So recommend, uh, let me just get rid of the elephant in the room about endorsements, okay? People in, I get this a lot, I have 10 years, I think I could make thousands of dollars from just answering this question, for a dollar for every time I've answered this question. Endorsement, think of endorsements like happy clicks on your website. You might get endorsed by people who have never worked with you or for you at all. And you'll be wondering, why the hell are they endorsing me? I don't know them, right? But here's the thing. They're coming from a space of good intention. They just want to be a good LinkedIn citizen and they want to help you in some way. That's it, guys. Leave it at that. Just call it a happy click, as I call it. It's sending happy vibes your way and let it go. Breathe in, breathe out and let it go. Enjoy the flow is all I say. But recommendations are massive for credibility holders, right? And so... I'm going to give you the formula to write a recommendation and exactly how to ask for a recommendation so you get one just the way you need it. Is that cool? Hell yes, if you want that, because that's just pure gold. Now, a little brief story about recommendations. I remember a couple of years ago, I had done a free consultation uh, with, two com uh, with two directors of a company um, one guy lived in Brisbane, one was in Sydney, it was a Skype call. And I remember, stupidly, might I add, I gave them a great idea for free that could have netted them $86,000 in sales. And I just handed it on a silver platter. Do you know how, he, has anyone else done that? I, I'm, I'm in sales and I still give away the house without asking money for it from time to time. We just do, right? Anyhow, um, they were still keen to go ahead and help on how to implement that, you know, great idea. And, um, and so they were, they were curious, they were just wanted to talk about it amongst themselves before proceeding. And I said, yeah, that's fine, no problems at all, let me know. Well, the next day at four o'clock in the afternoon, I remember getting an email from them saying, you know, Julie, could you please send us a couple of names or referrals of people that you've worked with in the past um, uh, that you've helped and and I have to say I must it just must have been a bad time of that day but I kind of saw red I kind of you know I just gave you an 86 what more proof do you want than you know I've given you this amazing strategy I haven't charged you for it damn it I've given you this amazing strategy and now you still want further proof and my husband who was home at the time took one look at my face going redder and redder and he said honey Step away from the computer and no one will get hurt. Now, I don't often listen to my husband's advice, but I did that day and I'm really grateful that I did. I, I shut down everything. I went away. I calmed my energy down and I came back the next morning and I turned my, my computer on and there was another email from the same guy. And, he, and the subject line was ignore my last email. And he opened it up and the content was said, please ignore my last email. I've just read your LinkedIn recommendations. Nothing more needs to be said. Are we going ahead with you? And I went, oh, thank God, because I could have burned bridges had I responded <laughs> to that email on that day, right? So this is what I'm talking about really clearly. This is your credibility holder. 
this is where um, where you can ask and and you want to think about this in your process of working with your clients that at a certain point when somebody's hired you that in that early stages that you ask them for a recommendation of the work that you're doing while you're still in that honeymoon phase as I like to call it they still love you right they still are gobbling up you in in juicy big mouthfuls and they they just love you and they're advocating you that's when you want to ask them for a recommendation okay is that cool everyone and yes my husband's a very wise man and he stayed married to me for 28 years so good good on him <laughs> all right so not only have I received 77 recommendations for various things over the years, but I've given 69. And here's a little tip for you. If you struggle with how to write a recommendation, guess where you can come? You can come onto my LinkedIn profile. You can scroll all the way down to my recommendations and you click, click on given and you can see how I've written some of my recommendations for clients. And that will inspire you on how to write them yourself as well. How does that sound? Is that cool? Put cool in the chat box if you like that as a tip, okay? All right, awesome. I know you're all busy writing notes and trying to do everything at once, but here we go. I'm trying to give you as much resource and help as possible, okay? So I'm gonna flip back over now to my, to my PowerPoint slides and I wanna show you the formula of how to do this, okay? So recommendations are so great social proof. It's our credibility holder. They must come from a first level connection. Um, and you can have them written either to showcase your business service, for example, or products, or you can have them written to showcase your character. So there are two types of recommendations you can ask for. One, two, if, if they've been a client of yours and um, they've experienced your service, then you can do that. But if they haven't experienced your client, but they've known each other through networking or associations for a while, and you would really appreciate them giving um, some feedback or, or a recommendation on the character of who you are, then you could ask for a character recommendation, okay? So that's the two that you can ask for. And here's the formula. I want everybody, if you've got your mobile phones ready, uh, take a screenshot of this now quickly. Um, I know for the ILP members, you're going to have this in the recording. For those of you who don't, make sure that you take a screenshot because this is the, the basically fill in the blanks of how to write a recommendation. Really, I'm trying to make this as easy as possible for everyone, right? So I've got here descriptive phrase, and I'll come back to that in a moment. A descriptive phrase, actually, no, let's address it to start with. A descriptive phrase could be, um, uh, flawless is how I is the phrase that comes to mind when I think about Narelle. I've had the pleasure of knowing Narelle for several years, during which time she has uh, created six amazing graphic design projects for me. So do you see how flawless the descriptive phrase ties into what I'm recommending her for for graphic design? Okay. Above all, I was impressed with Narelle's ability to quickly capture uh, my, my ideal outcome and deliver that, that project quickly and seamlessly. And of course, she's such a joy to work with. Narelle would be a true asset to anyone looking for a great graphic designer. Do you see how I'm filling in all the blanks there? Everyone got that? Yeah, cool. Okay. So that is how you can use a simple, you know, formula to write your, your recommendations. And by the way, go on and have a look at how I've written mine, the 69 that I've written, and that will give you some really great tools. And another one, while I remember it, there's a terrific book that I love to use, I'll just bring it here. I'll just stop the share for a second so you can all see this so it's not a teeny weeny little screen. Corrine, if you're on here, you've got some more work to do, love. Here we go. Okay, this book here, it's called More Words That 
Sell by Richard Bayan, B-A-Y-A-N, there's his name, More Words That Sell by Richard Bayan, okay? And do you see the side note? It's a thesaurus to help you promote your products, services, and ideas. <laughs> All right. Now, he has got a first book that's called Words to The Words That Sell. Don't buy that one. It's not as good. The first book wasn't as good. The second book is brilliant. All right. So you want this book. And this is not a book that you read. It's literally, so this chapter is health and wellness words. And there's all the health and wellness words. So if you're looking to write something on whether it's financials or whether it's health and wellness, or you're looking for descriptive words, negative qualities, positive qualities, um, flavors, emotional words. Oh, we've talked a lot about emotion today. So you can talk about emotional words and there's all the breakdown of the emotional words. This isn't a book that works well on Kindle, can I just say. This is a book you need as a resource, okay? So grab this, it is, it is well worn. I've got the delaminating my copy here, highly recommend. Thank you, Kareen, you are a legend, wherever you are on this call, Mwah! big hugs. All right, guys, so that's a great resource to find those descriptive words, there she is, thank you, Kareen, um, to find those descriptive words that help you fill in some of those blanks. Is that cool, everyone? It's a great resource. I recommend it to all my clients. Okay. Oh, Rachel, you had the first edition. Look, get the second book. It's great. <laughs> okay. Terrific. All right. Let's go back to our slides here and I'll share my screen. Ah, oh, take a deep breath, everyone. I'm going to have a sip of water at the same time. Okay. Here is the, the phrase again for everybody. Please get your cameras out. Take a photo of this. It's word for word. What I do when I ask somebody to give me a recommendation. So while you do that, I'm going to have a drink of water. Okay. So I'll read this out. Dear Joe, I was wondering if I could ask you for a recommendation on the work we've done together. I've taken the liberty of jotting down a few notes. However, please feel free to add or amend as you see fit. Now notice in bold writing, I've got insert recommendation. Here's the thing, guys. When you just ask somebody to give you a recommendation and you don't give them some framework around it, they have all the best intentions for doing it. But just like sending you an email or filling in your contact box message on your website, they get writer's block. And they don't have the benefit of the formula I've just given you on how to write a recommendation. So they are going to be all at sea on how to do that, right? So take the liberty. And by the way, I haven't done this for all my recommendations, but occasionally if I'm after a specific one, I will. If they're really struggling and they say, can you help me do this, Julie? I go, sure, I can. And I find that, guys, tell me if I'm wrong, but isn't it so much easier to edit something than to have to think about it from scratch? So if you ask them to, here's one that I've taken the liberty of jotting down, please feel free to add or amend as you see fit. It's so much easier to edit something than to have to sit there and think about it, okay, and not end up in the good intentions bucket that ends up not being done. But I always give them a, 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 a reason to pull out if they don't feel comfortable. And I say, if you don't feel comfortable doing so, that's totally cool. I'll look forward to staying connected and staying in touch. Cheers, Julie. So always give a soft fall point for them to, to go, I'm not putting enormous pressure on here. It would be great, but if you don't feel comfortable about it, I totally get it and that's okay, all right? So always allow that elegant, you know, it's okay if you say no, I won't be offended to come through. Is that cool? All right. So how do you ask on LinkedIn for a recommendation? Well, there is a couple of tips for this. So for example, if I was to go onto Kerry's profile here, so Kerry, I'm, I'm just gonna pop on your profile for a moment. Don't worry, honey, it looks lovely. Okay, so I'm popping onto Kerry's. If I wanted to give Kerry a recommendation, I need to go to her profile and I need to click this more button, we need to be, remember, we need to be first level connections. 
So I'm already connected to Kerry. And by the way, if you guys aren't, please connect with her on LinkedIn. She is awesome source, okay? There's her profile on there. So if I wanted to give Kerry a recommendation, I would simply click on the more button and from the drop down area, I would choose recommend, okay? And it's going to ask me a couple of questions. It says, first of all, how do I know Kerry? And I can say that I worked with Kerry, but at different companies. Or I could say that Kerry was a client of mine, for example, or I was a client of Kerry's, right? But in this case, we'll say, I worked with Kerry, but at different companies. Is that cool, Kerry? <laughs> Thumbs up. Yep, no worries. Okay, position at this at the time. So I'm going to select the position that Kerry was at when I worked with her. And so she was the founder of the Asia Pacific Institute for Learning and Performance. And I simply click next. And then this is where I would type in that recommendation. Okay, again, I highly recommend doing this on a notepad or on a Word document before I actually put it live and then I can copy and paste it straight in. And really think about if you're doing this to somebody that hasn't asked you for a recommendation, then have a look at their profile and see how you could help them from what their current profile is written on. You know, what is their, what is their current strategy? What are they promoting at the moment? And then write a recommendation that would actually support where their business is going at the moment. Does it make sense, everyone? Put a yes in the chat box if that makes sense. Okay, so that's how you give a recommendation. Now let's look at how you ask for a recommendation. So again, if I wanted to ask Kerry for a recommendation, I'd simply click the more button. I have to go to her profile, click the more button. And in this case, I click request a recommendation. Okay, again, I'm gonna have two questions to answer. What was the relationship? We will put Kerry worked with you, but at different companies and what was my position at the time. And in this case, I might choose the current business, which I've got multiple current businesses, remember. So in this case, I might put lead generate, LinkedIn lead generation, sales strategist, LinkedIn expert trainer, and LinkedIn speaker at, right? So something like that, right? So I choose the one that's most relevant, okay, to the work that I did with Kerry. Again, I click next. And instead of doing this default, Hi, Kerry, could you write me a recommendation? Of course, I'm going to use that lovely template that I've given you guys, and I'm going to put in a couple of notes and say, Kerry, here's a couple of ideas I'd really love. If you could flesh that out in your own words, that would be great. Or, or I could even write it in full for her if I wanted to and say, that would be awesome. Please feel free to add or amend as you see fit. And if you don't feel comfortable, that's totally cool as well, okay? So I'd put that in there and I'd click send. Now, Kerry would get a, a, an email that would come from LinkedIn saying, Julie has asked you for a recommendation. It would have a, the message, including the section that I've asked. She could, if she wanted to, copy and paste that. And then in the email, it'll have a blue button that it would take her directly to my profile and insert that in and click send and I would get a message saying that that had been confirmed. Does that make sense? Has everyone got that? Cool. Whew, how are we going, everyone? <laughs> Is your heads exploding yet? <laughs> are your hands hurting from writing so much? Are you getting writer's cramp, Adam? Are you? I can only see Adam and Kerry on the video, so I feel for you, I really do. But I'm so proud of you for hanging in. We're, we're getting through this really well, okay? And all of this is so important. This is, we've, we've covered now the fundamentals. Now we're going to get into connection and we're now going to get into content, okay? So I want to talk to you about that. And before we get into that, I really want to talk about using LinkedIn search. How to use LinkedIn search effectively. So this is, this is again tying back to our ideal client avatar. How do we find that ideal client, right? How do we find them? And so I'm going to give you an example and I'm going to give you three different examples of how you use LinkedIn search, okay? The first one is to search for people, all right? So we're going to search for people on the first one. And so 
Um, the example that I'm going to give here is a client of mine. His name is Jeff Doyle. He's here in Brisbane. And he, um, I'll just close that off, the little pop-ups that happen. He is a bookkeeper and uh, his background though, interestingly enough, is he owned three McDonald's franchises with his ex-wife in Townsville. And unfortunately in the divorce, she got the McDonald's and he got back down to Brisbane and started all over again at the late 50 year old age bracket, which is tough going, right? Really hard going. But in the McDonald's franchises, he did all the book work in the back end and he was really well known for it um, with his compatriots in McDonald's, but also with head office. They were real, they held him up as the be like Jeff kind of person for this, you know, to get all the reports in. And so when I asked him, you know, uh, who was his target market, he said everyone. And I went, hmm, okay, knowing your background, you've got much more resonance with people who have worked through a franchise type system, you know, that have been in the franchise area and even more so who have been in the food and beverage franchise programs, right? That's where his gold really is, that he can exactly show them how to run those business. So when we looked at who his target market was, we identified that that was one of them. So we type in, the word franchisee, okay, that's who we're looking for. The key word that we're looking for is franchisee, okay? Now, when we bring that up, it comes up with worldwide results. And you can do this on the free version, by the way, not just premium or sales navigator. And I'll talk about premium sales navigator later, but for now, I just want to talk about the free version, okay? Everything I teach, you can do on the free version. So worldwide, there are 185,312 profiles that show up on LinkedIn with the keyword franchisee in it. So we're gonna use these lovely search filters at the top of LinkedIn to filter that down a little bit more. First one that we're going to hit is we're gonna to filter to people, okay? And then we've got 185,000. So we get rid of a couple of hundred there, right? Then we're gonna choose location because we don't want everywhere. Personally, we'd like Brisbane and we don't have Brisbane showing up here. We've got Sydney, Melbourne and Australia. So we're gonna to have to type Brisbane into the search filtering box here. When it comes up, we're going to select Brisbane, Australia and click apply. Now, believe it or not, just a little side note, did you know that there are 869,000 members on LinkedIn based in Brisbane? 869,000 members based in Brisbane on LinkedIn. Wow. If you can't find, if you're in Brisbane and you can't find your target market in that, people, you are not looking hard enough. <laughs> All right. So we've got 2,200 search results that come up for the keyword franchisee for our lovely friend, Jeff. Okay. Now, while this is really good, we're going to have people who are franchisees that you know, first class capital, which is kind of what he does. You know, we're going to have restaurateurs, we're going to have cartridge world, we're going to have gyms mowing and all sorts. So I want to come back up to our filters again for a moment. And in this case, I want to click all filters. And we're going to click on that. And we're going to come down here to industries. And we're going to filter by industry now. And we're going to choose food and beverage industry. Because while 2,200 is great, that's a little overwhelming still. And we can get a little bit, man, I don't know, I've got so much work to do. But if we choose filter and, and go down to 86 from 2,200 members in Brisbane on LinkedIn who are franchisee to 86, and we can see that these are all franchisees at Subway and Gloria Jeans and Shingle Inn and Donut King, et cetera, et cetera. That's a much easier pool to swim in and to, you know, it's, it's nearly, it's, it's look, it's nearly like shooting fish in a barrel, right? Because when you have then a strategy that will speak exactly to those people that we can build trust and nurture those relationships and showcase how Jeff has got great connectivity, that he's not just a bookkeeper, but he's been in their shoes 
that's going to help build trust. And here's what happened from this. See this one down here at Shingle Inn, the Shingle Inns? He ended up in conversation during the, with the Shingle Inn head office for doing the books for all the Shingle Inn franchises in Australia, which is about 61. How cool is that? Right? So you can leverage this really well when you know how to find your target market. And the problem is, is that some of these are not within your space. Adam, great question. Why are some of those search results showing as LinkedIn member with no ability to connect? Let me blow your mind here for a little bit, Adam. I love blowing people's minds. So I'm going to click on this one here. All right, this is out of my network. I've got limited visibility, right? So often you will find that if it doesn't have connect, um, then, and LinkedIn are cracking down on this, it's probably to push you up into the, um, the, what do you call it? The, just trying to think, the uh, premium subscription. Sorry, I had a mind blank there for a moment, the premium subscription. But I'll give you another example of this that I know works really well. So let's say I just search for anybody named Adam on LinkedIn for a moment, and I'm going to search um, level of connection. We're not going to go for food and beverages. We'll clear that one out and we'll clear out Brisbane, Australia. We'll just leave it as people who are listed, you know, for um, clear those, cancel and apply. Oh, hang on, clear and cancel. Cancel and apply. All right, clear and apply. Um, so if I just choose Adams and I then choose connection levels, so first, second, third level, how can I explain this? Okay. To make it easy for those who don't understand first, second, and third level, I'll, I'll explain it like this. And you'll have to deal with my crap drawing, okay, people? Okay, the people that you are directly connected to are your first level connections, okay? The people that they're connected to are your second level connections. Right, and you'll see my crap drawing in a moment. And then the people that they're connected to it gets worse as I go along, is third level. I don't know if anyone can see that in the visual. Can everyone see that? So I'll stop sharing my screen for a moment so you can, for everyone, you can see that, right? So that's how it explains first second. Do you see what I mean about crap drawing? It's fast drawing, but there you go. All right, and my little $4 came up whiteboard. <laughs> Yes, it looks like a COVID infection graphic, exactly. You can break that by washing your hands. Um, <laughs> all right, <laughs> good on you. Um, okay, so coming back to sharing my screen for a moment. All right, here we go. Right, so if I choose my third level connections, they will be, you'll often see that there will be connect, connect, connect here, but there'll be some that just have nothing. It will have follow, for example. So Adam, this is what I wanted to point out to you. Past that third level, it's very hard for you to connect with anything past the third level. LinkedIn won't give you that option. Does that make sense? Because they are so far out of your your circle of influence that they go, you don't know these people at all. You have no even mutual or, you know, by third degree, you know, separation connections that we're just not going to open that up. But third level can also prove challenging for people as well. So Adam here doesn't have a connect button. He has a follow button. However, if I click on his profile, here's the little zip around on this one. While it's only got third and follow, I can click on here and it allows me to connect. Does it make sense? Has everyone got that? So while it only has follow show up here, if he is the person that I need to connect to, I can circumnavigate that by clicking on the more and choosing connect, okay? So it's a little hack for you guys, okay? All right, you discovered that the other way. But you can't do that if they're like fourth level or beyond. It just doesn't allow you. And part of that is because LinkedIn's terms and conditions are only connect with people that you know, which is just a whole load of Balkan because you still need to connect to people you don't know yet in order to get to know them. Ugh, give me a break, LinkedIn. <laughs> but that's the reason, okay? 
All right, so, um, so that's how you delve in on a people search. Now I wanna give you a second search. Uh, we've got three searches to do. So the second search is finding groups where your target audience are, are congregated. Okay, now I'm not gonna go into groups a lot today because they've gone through a rough trot LinkedIn groups over the last couple of years and just starting to get their feet under them again. And that's a whole nother conversation, okay? But if you wanna find where your target audience are hanging out, this is a really good example. So. About nine years ago, I had a young guy come up to me after a speaking event and he said, Julie, I'm a yacht designer, to which I kind of drool, like the drool of yacht designer, lovely, that sounds fabulous. Um, uh, he said, but I, I design yachts for my employer and he keeps all of my designs. I'd really like to go out on my own and be able to keep my designs for my own IP. And I said, that's a great idea. I said, tell, tell me what the problem is. He said, well, I don't just design your standard yacht. I design super yachts, to which I drooled from both sides of my mouth. <laughs> I said, that's fantastic. And I can immediately see where the problem was coming. I said, he was about 26 years old. And I said, so let me guess, you don't know anyone with a spare $13 million in change to build a super yacht of their own and have you design it? And he said, um, yep, that about sums it up. And I went, okay. And this, and I want you to remember guys, this is nine years ago, okay, nine years ago. So all we did is I said, let's type in the word super yacht. Okay, that's it, just super yacht. And by the way, guys, ignore this drop down menu that appears because it's not a really good indication of filtering in and digging into some of these searches, okay? So with people one in particular, ignore this. So just click the magnifying glass at the end of it or hit enter. And in this case, we want to find groups of people. We don't just want, because people aren't going to put on their profile that they own a super yacht. They just don't. Right? Bill Gates isn't going to put on, hey, I own super yacht XYZ name. They're not going to do that. But they will join a group of common interests. Does it make sense? Yeah, so in this case, we want to filter by groups, okay? There are over 100 groups for the keyword super yacht on LinkedIn. That's today. Nine years ago, there was eight groups. That's how much it's grown in nine years, right? And the top group here, super yacht professionals, used to be called super yacht professionals and owners, and nine years ago, only had 1,800 members in it. Now it has 17,000 heading to 18,000. Do you think we were able to find his target market on LinkedIn really quickly? Right? Absolutely. So groups are a great place for where your clients are hanging out. Okay? That's great. I'm glad that some, I can't pronounce your first name. And, and Anna, Anna, Lea, Anna Lea, I think, is going back to her connections and connect better and make conversation and not hard sell like you did before. That's great. I love that. And Rachel, I sort my connections every year and keep them below 5,000 to give me a chance to keep in touch, good or bad. Um, there's no right or wrong with that, Rachel. It's a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. There's no right or wrong with that. Um, but one thing to be mindful of, and this is while I have my crap drawing out. So that's a really good question. So I'll just stop the share here so you can all see here for a moment. When it comes to content, if you minimise your connections, what happens is when you post content on the newsfeed, sorry here, you post content on the newsfeed, your first and second level connections often will see it very rarely to the third level, but definitely first and second. So the more targeted and strategic your first level connections are, and don't be afraid to connect in with colleagues and peers, et cetera, as well. The more people they're connected to, the greater reach on that second level will be your content. Does it make sense? So it gives you greater reach for when you post that not only your first level connections see it, but the connections beyond that as well. Does that help? Um, I hope that answers that question. I hope that's a bit of an aha moment for some of you as well. So it's not about 
reducing down. You can, if 5,000 is comfortable for you, great. But remember the gold is actually often in that second level connection on LinkedIn. So um, there are people with 30,000 connections. Is that good? Uh, I wrote a LinkedIn article on that, Rachel, that you, uh, everyone I think will have a good chuckle when you hear the title of it. <laughs> it's called, and Corrine, no doubt you're going to go and find this article on my LinkedIn profile and put the link on, on the chat box for everyone. The article is called, What Does Sex and LinkedIn Have in Common? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Some people treat connecting like notches on their bedpost, but my advice is, Sex is so much better with foreplay. Have a relationship. Build some romance into that. Don't just go for the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. So there is a great example of some scripts in there to write as well. Read the article. It's fantastic. Oh, Corrine's off. She's on a roll. I love you, Corrine. Thank you so much. And I hire you to come to all of my events, I swear. All right, so great article and it has some really valuable tips inside it as well. Don't let the name put you off, but it really caught some attention of people on LinkedIn. So Super Yacht, we've found out how to find groups. When you're a member of these groups, and I'll just bring up one of my groups, which is Brisbane Professionals, for example. So I'll bring up Brisbane Professionals. It's a group that I often recommend if you're if you're if you have a business that's geographically located, then definitely look for groups to join that are in your local area, such as Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or, you know, um, New York, whatever it might be. Don't be afraid to join some geographical location groups as well. And here's the interesting thing. When you're in that group, this group has 14,425 members in it. I can click here on see all and I can start to engage and, and to search through those members and build a relationship. I can even message them without being connected to them as well, right? So it allows me to find my target market and start to develop a relationship through that group um, that will serve us both well. Oh, look, Corrine's found the link to the group, to the post. Thank you, my love, you're a blessing, thank you. Um, so yes, definitely um, use groups to Find where your target audience is and start to communicate and, and to connect with them as well, okay, outside of the group. And a great connection message, let's say, let's say Tony's profile here is my target market, right? And we're in the same group together. I look at his profile, waiting for my internet to slowly come together. And I click connect and this is streaming now into our connection best strategies process. I would always recommend you add a note. So I would say, hey, Tony, I noticed uh, we are both members of Brisbane Professionals here on LinkedIn. I'm... Um, I'd, I'd love, and use your language. You don't, I, I use love and Han and sweetie and stuff like that all. It's my language, right? I'd love to get to know more about what you do and uh, if there may be some good synergy in us connecting. Okay, cheers. Julie. All right. So I'm, I know, hang on, hang on. I can see where you might be going, Adam. I'm going to expand that up. If you'd like to take a quick photo of that, everyone, grab your cameras, take a photo um, so you can get an idea of the message that I would send. But this message, this connection message, keep it, so keep it light and bright is what I usually call it. You're welcome, Adam. I could see that you were going, don't let it go up. <laughs> so when you do it, I know everybody else wants it as well. Right. So, um, so essentially, um, all you have to do in this message is answer the question that's going through their mind as to who is this random person and why are they reaching out to connect with me? And you just need to show a little bit of commonality, whether it's a commonality that you're both in a group, 
whether that you might be in the same industry, whether that they might be your target market, although you can't say that, you might just simply say, hey, I noticed that you're working in um, the, you know, uh, textiles manufacturing industry. I've got a couple of clients in there and your profile popped up. I, I found it really interesting. So I thought I'd reach out to connect. And that just simply answers in their mind, why have you chosen them? Because the biggest question that I get on LinkedIn is who is this random and why are they connecting with me, right? That's the biggest question. We, we seem to be a little paranoid about people connecting with us. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, but I've got one more search feature to do before as well. Um, Rachel, and I understand, not this will not fit everybody, okay? Um, so Rachel finds this message a little creepy, and I totally get that. But at the end of the day, I want you to also suspend judgment. And I'm, I'm going to expand on this a bit more, but let me go back and finish our search criteria first. And then I'm going to talk about other aspects of connecting, okay? So stay with me for a moment. All right. Okay, so our last version of connecting is finding companies where your target, uh, your target companies. And the problem with LinkedIn on the free and the premium version, not Sales Navigator, but the free and the premium version, is when searching for companies, your criteria is very limited. And unless you know the, uh, the type of, the name of the company, it can be very challenging to find. So for example, um, if, you're, if you're doing a search to find companies with the keyword Brisbane in them, I would just type in Brisbane and it's a very broad search. And in this case, we're not looking for people, we're not looking for groups, we are looking for companies and you would search down on the filters to the more and click companies and there will be 13,505 company pages that come up with the keyword Brisbane in that. But that's a lot of filtering. And you know what? The white pages online, for example, or um, the old fashioned yellow pages, and I still get a copy of those land on my, on my doorstep every so often, um, they can still be your best friend in finding companies in specific arenas. But Google has now kind of really replaced that. So do a little Google search and then find the company name. And here's the thing with this. This is where you really want to stalk a little bit. Let's say you've identified that your ideal client uh, works for a particular company. Let's say it is um, Brisbane Marketing, for example, I'm just going to click on Brisbane Marketing and you really want to get whatever contract it is that they're doing for Brisbane Marketing and be the supply, the preferred supplier or preferred trainer or whatever that might be for them. And uh, you definitely, my advice is if they have a company page and they're actively posting on it, follow their company page first off, right? So click follow on that so that you can see what they're posting and have that show up in your newsfeed. That allows you to personalize your outreach, your, your personal messages or your direct messages more to what they're doing and what they're sharing on social as well. And you can say, hey, I saw that, you know, um, that we've been selected or that, you, you know, uh, uh, Brisbane's been selected for the Australian Youth Water Polo Championship. That's fantastic. Congratulations on, on um, you know, getting that win for Brisbane City Council. That is awesome. And send them a congratulations message. It's not a, hell, it's not a heavy sell message, but it's a great touch point. And how often nowadays do we get a message of recognition and congratulations as opposed to all of the inverted commas spam messages and heavy pitch messages that we get. So this positions you immediately as head and shoulders above everybody else on LinkedIn by taking the time and effort to actually engage with what they're posting about. And don't just do it on the profile, on their thing, by all means, comment on it here. Definitely want to comment because when you have a company page or you're posting content, you pay attention to the comments and trust me, so do your clients, okay? Or your prospective clients. So comment on their stuff, show up, start to be 
recognized by your name for what you're you're contributing to and engaging with what they're posting okay the second part of this is that if you find the company that you want to work for you can come over here where it says see all 100 188 employees on linkedin you can click on that and then start to filter who is the decision maker you need to connect with in order for you to get that contract or that service agreement with. Does it make sense? So it really pays to pay attention to the company page, engage with it, and then connect with the decision makers or make maker or makers of that company that will help you get your services in the door. All right. Does that make sense, everyone? Please put a yes in the chat box so I know because it was a little complicated jumping from one point to the other and I just want to make sure I haven't lost anybody along the way. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, where did I click? You just missed that. All right, so if I go back a page to the company page and I want to see who the employers are that are on LinkedIn, so this is the company page that we've searched for, and then all I do is over here, I see where it's got see all 188 employers on employees on LinkedIn. I click on that and then I can search through that 188 to find the decision maker that would want to be able to have my services come into their, their space. And then I would definitely connect with them and develop that relationship in conjunction with engaging on their content on their company page. Whew. We're on the we're on the home straight, guys. How are you hanging in there? <laughs> All right. I know we've got a few people dropping off, and it's and it's close to lunch. But I'm so proud of you for hanging in. We're nearly there. We're on to content. Um, all right. Are you ready? All right. We're going to the home page of LinkedIn, and we're going to talk content. All right. So. You've got about five different types of content that you can post on LinkedIn. I'll just quickly run through them. Um, the first one is a standard update. I'm just calling it a standard update. That's here, right? And that's where you can actually add a, an image or a video or a document. Um, you can create, we, you can now create a poll in here as well. You can do some market research and create a poll here too. Um, you can refer connections and celebrate a teammate, all sorts of things. But essentially, it's what I call a standard update, okay? And it allows you to do quite a lot here. Let me give you some best practices with a standard update. What's working well on LinkedIn at the moment is long text posts. So I think it's about 1,800 characters, I think might be the might even be less than that. I, I might be getting my numbers mixed up at the moment. I've been talking nonstop since eight this morning. So it's getting a little fried in the, the, the synapses there just at the moment. So it, it is a 1200. Thank you, Janine. Thank you. Um, 1200 characters to write that. And what's working well is doing a, a sprinkling of emojis through those long text posts. That seems to be getting some really good traction. But here's the trick. You want to add hashtags. And a lot of people are going, what the hell are hashtags, right? Because LinkedIn has become the biggest content site on the internet for business, they now need a way to categorize the content that gets posted on there. So that's characters, by the way, 1200 characters, not words, 1200 characters. So you really need to use hashtags that will help people find your content. So for example, if I was doing some posts, I would use, and I'm doing it about this workshop, which I have done for the last week, I would be doing LinkedIn workshop, LinkedIn, hashtag LinkedIn workshop, hashtag LinkedIn training, hashtag online event. Does it make sense? So that people can, um, people can find, if they go onto LinkedIn and they search for content like LinkedIn, you know, training, 
that my post will come up and it gets more views from those, those who are actively looking, actively seeking for that, right? Does it make sense? So hashtags are really important, but here's the interesting thing with LinkedIn in comparison to Instagram or Facebook. It's the first three hashtags that are the most important. You can do more than that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing Instagram 19 or nine or whatever. You can do a few more than that. You will still show up for those hashtags, but the first three are embedded into the URL of that post. So then they get cached by Google. So those three hashtags become the key words to actually, for Google to cache and rank your post accordingly as well. Oh my goodness. How cool is that, right? So hashtags, um, oh, Jennifer, I'm not sure, maybe, do you know that is one answer I don't have for you? Are hashtags counted in the word count? I'm going to assume yes, but um, thank you, Janine. Janine has confirmed, yes, uh, they are. So they definitely counted. Thank you so much. Um, you can be a LinkedIn expert and still not know everything, guys. I'm really the sales strategist, so I'm not into all necessarily the nitty gritty. I try and give as much as I can, but thank you, great people, for answering that. I really appreciate it. All right, so you definitely want to kind of try and stay, I would say no more than five hashtags on LinkedIn in, in total. Make sure that you put them in order of importance. And if you are a bricks and mortar business, for example, your products and services are like Jeff Doyle who does bookkeeping and wants to just do Brisbane, then use a geographical location hashtag in there as well. They may not be your first three, but put it into those five hashtags so that you know then around geolocating your content as well as you know targeting the content topic as well. Does that make sense? So then you're not just topic targeting, you're geolocating, targeting your content as well. Whew, I'm going to need a good lie down after this session, I tell you. <laughs> Man, I, I'm sure you guys are probably going to need to take some headache tablets and decompress after this as well. So we'll all have a good lie down afterwards. All right, so that's the first type of content. You can play around with this. You're not going to break anything. The polls are great to do some market research. Have a fun time with that. Um, they are really good to get some market research happening and some great engagement happening. And don't be afraid to do the odd at mention for people who you'd really like their feedback on those polls as well. So what I mean by an at mention is that if I wanted to target, for example, I wanted my post to not only show up on my profile, but I wanted to say, Kerry Brocks, thanks so much for generously allowing me to present today. Um, when I do this, for example, that's not only going to show up on my profile and to my connections, but it's going to show up on Kerry's profile and to Kerry's connections. Does that make sense? So only tag people doing the at mention, we call it, only tag people that you know would be okay with you doing that. I get tagged in a lot of posts that actually, quite frankly, piss me off because they're tagging me in things that are completely irrelevant to me and that are just trying to leverage my network reach. And that will really annoy people. So be circumspect with who you at mention in your posts, okay? That's a really important thing. I know, Kerry. You won't mind if I do that. I'm not going to post it today. I'll do a much nicer one, okay? <laughs> but essentially, we'll give Kerry a good shout out. In fact, hey guys, I'm going to do a really huge favour for Kerry here. I would love, love, love for you to go and give Kerry uh, a, a mention for putting on an amazing event here today for you guys. If you've loved it, Give her a shout out on, on LinkedIn. Kerry, Kerry's going to go, oh my God, LinkedIn's going to explode on me. And two, even more importantly, more importantly, connect with her and send her a recommendation for the great work that she does with ILP. 
because I know Kerry is the most humble person that I know and she doesn't realise how much an impact she makes in the community. So let's show her what an amazing person she is. Go and give her a recommendation, guys. She deserves it, okay? Mwah, Kerry, I love you. Mwah. <laughs> and now she just wants to fall in the floor. <laughs> All right, so that's how you do app mentions, okay? Let's talk about the other types of content that you can do. And we had somebody ask a question about the difference between a post and a, a LinkedIn article. So well, let's look at LinkedIn articles as the second type of content. And a LinkedIn article is like a blog post on LinkedIn, right? So it's, it, it really is. If you don't have a website, for example, where you, you can uh, add value and showcase your knowledge, etc., then I would definitely recommend you use LinkedIn articles for that. Now, when LinkedIn articles came out a whole while ago, they were brilliant, really, really brilliant. And every time you published one, your entire network got notified through the notifications tab. But now we've had so much content going out on LinkedIn, they kind of got left behind a little bit. So I want to teach you how to use LinkedIn articles strategically to add value to your connections. Remember when we do that emotional bank account, we want to add value in that very, very point of connection and to really use them elegantly to showcase the thought leadership that you have, etc. Okay. All right. So an article, very much like a blog post, I recommend always use a beautiful header image. Again, Canva is great for that. It has the templates and allows you to be this graphic designer. My advice is Download, and, and they have, they bought Pexels, by the way, P-E-X, I'll put that into the chat box. If you're looking for great images that don't cost you anything to, to download, Pexels.com, brilliant resource. I use it all the time. But Canva, which we talked about before, and I'll put that here again as well, Canva.com bought Pexels. So if you don't have great stock photos, you can actually use Canva's stock library, which is all the Pexels. Anyway. So you want a nice image up here, but my advice is when you're doing your articles, and I'll go to mine for a moment and show you what I mean, is that when an article shows up, if it just has the image in there and nothing else, sorry, here we go, in the image in there and nothing else, people don't often read the caption. So here's what I mean. Here's an article that I've written on how to give a great referral if I did not have this text, how to give a great referral across the image, it would get lost a little bit with just a thumbs up and people may not see this caption below. So my advice is always try and put the title of your article on your image so that it grabs people's eyeballs in the news feed. Does it make sense, everyone? All right. And you can see here, you can have some fun with it. I put them in, you know, what building a skyscraper in a business have in common and what a dry spell is good for your business, et cetera, et cetera. So always, you know, put in here um, some text that talks about what your article is, okay? And that will help stand that out. But you can also, articles allow you to have up to 40,000 characters. The sweet spot, now I'm going to flip from characters to words. How long should your article be? Research done on LinkedIn articles and there was a book written, literally a book written about LinkedIn articles that yes, I read. <laughs> That's how I roll, right? The, the research shows that the sweet spot for the length of article is around 1,200 words. 1,200 words. So approximately a page and a half A4 typing, okay, is a good, decent amount of LinkedIn article. But remember to make sure that you format it with lots of short paragraphs and spaces, bullet points and everything. And notice here that when you're doing your article, you have the ability to, to say, okay, I want to do a heading on this section here, and it will then come up as a heading, right? Or you can put it back into paragraph text, into normal text, whatever it might be. 
You can even add, if you click that little square, you can add an image, a video, you can embed a YouTube video in here. You can embed PowerPoint slides or links or even a snippet of something. So you can really format this so it's an eye-catching, juicy, rich, well-laid-out, readable article that works well. And my tips here, we've got five minutes. Oh my gosh, guys, I might go 10 minutes over. Can you hang in? Please let me know. Put a yes in the chat box if you're okay to go 10 minutes over because I still want some more good stuff. Okay, love you all. Right. <laughs> Okay, sorry, Kerry. I've been trying as hard as I can to get it in in three hours. <laughs> okay. All right. So, were the tips with this with your articles? And, and this is something that I learned from, from Facebook, for example, right? So, I'm going to come to this article here and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Is that um, make sure that you put capitals at the beginning of every word in your in your subject line. Again, we want to give it a power statement. Think of your article as being a, a, a New York Post article, the, the way they headline things, right? Give it the credence and the readability that it deserves. And there are formulas for writing headlines. There are free tools on Google that would help you write headlines so that they get engagement. I think there's a headline creator tool. Go Google that. It's great. Find that. It's, it's fantastic. If you suck at copywriting, it's a great resource. But make sure that you um, really put in here, you know, as you can see, short paragraphs. You can even see that I'm highlighting words in capitals or putting them in, you know, italics, etc. that I then give examples of bad referrals and use a headline here and then bold text here and Again, you know, um, using italics is how to, to do this. <laughs> Adam, your pen, I thought your hand would have worn off by now. Your pen's run out, has it? Um, really break it up a little bit, guys, and, um, and make it really readable, okay? And then here's the thing that I want you to promise me you'll do. Research shows that if you ask people to like your content, to comment on your content or to share your content, your engagement metrics will go up on all of those. Isn't that interesting? If we ask people to do something, they will do it. How cool is that? So if your articles are not getting the love they deserve, then definitely ask people to do that. Well, I know it sounds a bit corny, doesn't it? But I always say, if you found this post helpful, please share it with your connections. You could even say, or I look forward to reading your comments below. I'd love to hear your comments, right? And so then the second call to action, and this is elegant call to action, and there's two that I've got here. I've actually got three calls. I've snuck a third one in, right? So the second one is give them a little author bio on who you are and what you do, because they may not have found you through LinkedIn. They may not be a connection of yours. So they don't know who you are from Adam. So give them some context. And the cool thing with LinkedIn articles is that you can hyperlink to your LinkedIn, to your call to action pages on your website, if you like, as well. You can even hyperlink your images. This one is hyperlinked to a form, a type form, right? So I've made that one private, so I'd have to go and adjust it. But I linked this to a form that people could fill out where they could actually get a 30 minute free session with me. I, I don't have any spots available just at the moment, guys, sorry. But, but if I did, I would be happy to, right? Stay tuned if I open that up again, you might wanna jump on it. So guys, that's, um, that's the bonus. Now, how do I use LinkedIn articles? Well, let's say, I'm targeting uh, my ideal client who works at XYZ company. And from there, I want to uh, send that lovely connection request to them, the personal message with it. And the more personalized you can tailor that without looking like you're following them on the street on the way home, the better. But, you know, keep it light, keep it bright, as I say. Just let them know you're not an axe murderer. That's all I need you to do. All right. And then once they've accepted, you want to add value. Remember, I use articles on LinkedIn specifically because they've connected with you on LinkedIn. 
They want to stay on LinkedIn at this point. They don't want to go to your website because they don't trust you yet. You haven't built enough trust in your emotional bank account. So keep them on LinkedIn and write an article that will speak about that main problem that you solve. So you're going to write a strategic article that you can use that will talk about your ideal client and how they can do, how can they can get some relief or your thoughts around this problem and a solution for it, right? And again, when you give them great value, you've got the opportunity of putting these soft calls to action in the bottom of the in the bottom of the article. Mark, I feel your pain. You said three hours is too long in one big bang. You'll feel sorry for the people at the University of Sydney. They have a whole day of me doing this. <laughs> sorry. You're getting off lightly, my love. But um, I totally get it. Mwah. Well done. Um, anyhow, so guys, make sure you use your LinkedIn articles accordingly. And another tip for using LinkedIn articles is when you're joining those groups, use them as a beautiful thought leadership post in those groups. And if you're in 30 or 40 groups on LinkedIn, don't put it in all of them at once. Do 10 groups this week, 10 groups next week, 10 groups the week after. You know, spread it out a little bit and let that share the love. By the way, LinkedIn articles get um, cached. So if I search emojis on LinkedIn, okay, for example, my LinkedIn article that I've, I've written on tips on using emojis on LinkedIn is ranked third on Google search results for the keywords emojis on LinkedIn. That article has now had over 50,000 views. 50,000 views. And I would have thought that some of my other articles would be far better off than that one, but apparently emojis do it for people, right? Okay. Um, somebody, Rachel, said, someone told me that LinkedIn don't like repeating postings or articles. True or false? Look. I've had one article that I think I've sent around the traps at least four times because back in the day it was brilliant and it really needed to be shared. And I've never found it getting um, uh, downgraded or degraded. So uh, it's not my experience and I'm not really, here's the other thing. There are, there, there, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop the sharing, get in all, all nice and tight with you guys for a moment, okay? There are people out there who spend hours and hours on trying to figure out the LinkedIn algorithm. And quite frankly, yeah, I'm trying to game, you know, what content works best wherever possible, but I'm not going to waste my day on that because that's going to take me away from generating relationships that I can nurture into leads and sales for my business. Does it make sense? So you can waste a lot of time on figuring out what does what where. For me, I just want to show up and add value wherever I can. And that brings me to a, a quote that I've used for around about 20 years now. It's a Zig Ziglar quote, actually, that says, a sale is not something you pursue. A sale is something that happens to you when you're in the service of others. So I want you to serve at your highest level. Don't give a flying stuff about the algorithms. If you're serving well, serve. Serve with your heart and, and your mind and, and give your best stuff out there. People think that people won't buy from you if you give your best stuff. They will and they will buy more because you're de de demonstrating your generosity. You're demonstrating your knowledge. You're freely giving that and that is by far more powerful than anything else. Is that cool? Yeah, cool. All right. <sighs> I'm worn out. I feel for all of you. <laughs> How are we all going, guys? I think right now um, I'm going to start to wrap up. I'm going to put one thing in the chat box that if you would like to work with me a little bit more, I'm just going to say, if you need any further help, if you feel that you can't do this yourself or you need support, I would love for you to message me on LinkedIn and say, Julie, 
I'd love to have a chat. So I'm not asking you to send me a blank message and figure it out yourself. I'm telling you what to say. Message me on LinkedIn and say, Julie, I would like to have a chat about working further with you, okay? And I promise that we're going to get on the phone together and have a chat and see how we can do that. But in the interim, I'm not, I don't want to sell anything today. I just want to honour Kerry and the great team, and Bill, for that matter, the great team at ILP who have invited me on. And thank you again so much for having me. I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you have got. We have got time for a little Q&A. Anyone who wants to hang around, I'll hang around and do Q&A with you. If you need to rush off, I totally get it. But Kerry, thank you, my love, so much for having me here. And Bill as well. Thank you.